Okay, thank you. We're live on YouTube now, and again, welcome to all of the members of the public in, in our office here tonight, and welcome Colm McLean from the Journal Pioneer, and our Deputy Mayor McCallman and my fellow councillors, and we have our CAO Rob Philpott with us, and our Director of Finance, Kristen Dunsford, and Clayton Smith from Finance. We have Aaron McDonald, the engineer from Technical Services, and Linda Stevenson. And welcome to the viewing audience tonight as well, and a number, I understand a number of uh, members of the media will be watching the council meeting. So, at this point, I'll turn it over to the chair of the planning board, Councillor Brian McFeely. The floor is yours, sir. I thank you, Your Worship, and with your permission, I'll remain seated closer to the mic so people can hear me better. And uh, we've got a lot, of, uh, a lot of reading to do, so we will diligently work through the reading, and you poor people have to listen to it, so it's bad enough me reading, but people have to listen as well. And um, uh, certainly welcome, welcome all. This is uh, the planning board meeting. Uh, just to remind folks, Councillor Campbell? Just to change, it is a planning board meeting, right? Yes. And we don't vote? No. I took the words out of my mouth. Uh, it is a planning board meeting, so the voting members of planning board are uh, Councillor um, Adams, Councillor Ramsey, and uh, the mayor and I. Uh, that's planning board. Our job tonight is to, uh, is to uh, consider the information that we, uh, we, we, we received tonight. And um, get it to the council uh, meeting. There will be a uh, you know, a positive motion that will go forward. That motion will either be uh, be either passed or defeated, and then it will go to the the council meeting for consideration of all council of the request. So that's that's the process going forward. Um, the public meeting was held last week, and that is the opportunity for the public to to have input and to voice their views um, and certainly I'm going to read a bunch of letters uh, a lot of letters uh, into the uh, into the public record tonight as well um, so really tonight planning board uh, deals with it internally uh, if there is new information that we don't have then with the unanimous agreement of planning board we would uh, allow somebody from the public to uh, to express a view, um, but we, we really don't need to to review what was brought up at the public meeting. We have that recorded, and we know uh, we know uh, what people's particular views are on, on various aspects of this. So uh, we don't need a, re a repeat of the public meeting. But if there is new information, we would never ever uh, stifle uh, that information coming forward from the public. So it's kind of want to kind of make that clear and that's sort of how we work and as we move forward here uh, there's really 11 criteria and we'll talk about those criteria that that we need to evaluate rezonings on and, and we'll go through that uh, as, as, as we progress here so so with that um, um, we would call the meeting the planning board to order and ask for a motion to approve the agenda Moved by Councillor Adams, second by Your Worship, uh, that the agenda be uh, approved as circulated. Um, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Con contrary, the motion carried. So first thing on the agenda, we have two, two things on our agenda, really a recommendation on 395 Brophy Avenue official plan and zoning amendment. And then the other item is a recommendation of 395 Brophy Avenue park and green space plan amendment to the map. Uh, so we will proceed right into it. Um, okay, so <clears throat> the subject, uh, 395 Brophy, uh, Brophy Avenue official plan and zoning amendments. Supporting explanation, purpose. The purpose of the zoning amendment is to allow an apartment building development for buildings. Background, an application was initiated by the City of Summerside for a portion of PID number 322339 to amend the City's zoning bylaw from Parkland P zone to high density residential R4 zone. A public meeting was held on February 23, 2022 and Council gave first reading on the same date. And attached there is a map showing the subject property. 
So the report under section 5.7 of the zoning bylaw, when planning board reviews the zoning bylaw amendment, it has to consider the following general criteria as applicable. And that's the 11 criteria that I was speaking about. Under section 8.4 of the parks and green space plan, the criteria of B, C, E, G, and H must be considered. So item A, conformity with all requirements of this bylaw. Staff comment. If council approves the zoning map amendment P to R4, the property can be developed in accordance with the development standards of the R4. B, conformity with the official plan. Staff comment, the, zoning, the rezoning conforms to the official plan section 5.2.2, location of high density housing. The proposed amendment will require an amendment to the parks and green space plan. A separate report has been prepared to address the parks and green space amendment. So location of high density housing, and this is in the official plan, the statements in the official plan, under in uh, item 5.2.2 of the official plan. Council's intentions about locating high density housing are important to residents concerned about potential location of row houses and apartment buildings near the predominantly low density neighborhoods. To help alleviate these concerns, Council lays out specific policies below on where they may allow future high density housing some of which elaborate, which elaborate on their foregoing policies for special planning and development areas. So location criteria, council's criteria for locating high density housing in, in uh, the city of Summerside include, and the ones specific to this particular project are the ones in yellow, so I'll just read those into the record. The desirability of infilling properties which are already partly developed for higher density housing the desirability of locating high density housing close to jobs, community facilities and services and of promoting pedestrian access. Benefit of locating higher density housing in difficult to service areas so that they can help distribute expensive development costs among more users and avoidance of uh, negative economic and fiscal impacts on surrounding land uses, whether existing or proposed. <coughs> so the objectives um, that are laid out in the uh, official plan uh, around is to encourage high density housing in specific areas. The policy statements around that include uh, uh, the one particular to this one is promote high density housing on properties already partly developed for high density housing. So item C, suitability of the site for the proposed development. Staff comment, this 2.78 acre site can accommodate the proposed high density R4 residential land use being proposed. Item D, compatibility of the proposed development with surrounding land uses, including both existing and projected uses. Staff comment, the subject property abuts two land uses, parkland and residential. The lands to the immediate east, northwest, and a portion of the south are high density land use. A portion of the land use on the south would remain as parkland use. The proposed residential uh, project would be compatible with the existing land uses and the projected land uses. And the, the map is there showing the subject property as well as the, the park that would remain there. Item E, any comments from residents and other interested persons? <coughs> Staff comment. A public meeting was held on February 23rd, 2022. The public meeting notice was advertised in the February 8th edition of The Guardian. 32 letters were mailed to 26 property owners. Rob Philpot, City of Summerside, provided an overview of the development, noted that the housing is needed in the community and a portion of the lands. The subject property is vacant green space that is not currently being utilized. Written comments were received from 38 of the tenants at 376 Duke Street, uh, 338 Brophy and 391 Brophy, and are attached to this report. Written comments were also received from 34 tenants at 390 Brophy, and are attached to this report. The written comments were opposed to selling the land and rezoning the land. Terry Lynn. 
Galanth, 382 Brophy Avenue, submitted written comments. Her concerns were low income housing and increased traffic. Kathy and Bill McGinnis, owner of uh, 390 Brophy Avenue and Chesapeake Apartments, expressed concerns regarding the lack of notification in relation to the potential sale of the city land. Traffic concerns for their tenants and they opposed the uh, rezoning of the parkland. Jamie Rogerson, the developer, representative developer, was invited to speak. Mr. Rogerson was not advised he would need to provide a presentation. He answered questions as best he could under the circumstances. He submitted written comments to the city on February 25th, and we'll read those into the record afterwards, which are attached to this report. Uh, Bob McLeod, tenant at 390 Brophy Avenue, is not opposed to development, but does not want to see parkland rezoned. Anna Johnson, tenant 390 Brophy Avenue, raised concerns with the increase to traffic on Brophy Avenue and the noise that will be created during construction phase. Philip Cameron, owner 391 Brophy Avenue and 445 Tower Street, expressed concerns about losing this parkland and the traffic implications on his properties and tenants. As a result of this development, uh, written comments were received via email from Helen Clevett, 151 Brandon Carter Avenue, on behalf of Orville and Dorothy Kahn, 21, uh, 391 Brophy Avenue. The concerns raised uh, at the meeting are addressed throughout this report. So then there's a map there with the subject property showing the adjacent uh, apartments, et cetera, that are there. Uh, item F, the adequacy of existing water, sewer, road, storm water, and electrical services, city parking, and park land for accommodating the development and any projected infrastructure requirements. Staff comment, the city's water supply and sewer treatment system can handle the additional loading created by the change in zoning from its current parkland designation to R4. Rezoning from parkland lands to R4 does not have an impact on the sewage loading uh, of the Northumberland Street lift station. This change in zoning relates to an increase in, in load of approximately 55 cubic meters of sewage a day. This represents approximately 1% increase in sewage to the Northumberland Street lift station, which translates to a $18,900 cost to the utility. The city's water main infrastructure for this development is a 250 millimeter distribution main on Brophy Avenue, or a 300 millimeter transmission main from Duke Street that loops to Tower Street through the city park. If the transmission water main is to be used by the development, a new 250 millimeter water main is required to be looped to the top of Brophy Street. The city's sewer main infrastructure for this development is a 200 millimeter gravity collection main on Tower Street, or a 375 millimeter gravity collection main on Brophy Avenue. Both these mains can handle the additional sewer loading for the zoning change. The developer is responsible for securing easements and extending mains for gravity sewer if grades for the elevations and, and grade, uh, excuse me, uh, if grades for connection through the lot originally access this off Brophy Avenue, do not work based on building elevations and, and grade of uh, sewer lines. A private lift station for the development would be an option if gravity sewer does not work. The developer is responsible for all servicing costs due to zoning changes and the land development. Brophy Avenue was constructed as a part of the town of Summerside's land assembly starting in the early 1980s to encourage residential growth in the former town. The east end of Brophy Avenue was, entitled to con uh, was intended to connect to Duke Street and Elm Street was to be extended to Brophy Avenue. Currently, Brophy Avenue does not extend to the end of the existing street right away. The city will need the budget uh, to complete the street uh, cul-de-sac. Uh, the access for the proposed development will be via Brophy Avenue. 
The development's internal access road and parking layout will be reviewed upon development. The development has a large hard surface parking and roof drainage area which is required to be piped through an underground drainage system connecting to the existing city storm sewer. As per the City of Summerside Subdivision and Site Development uh, Bylaw SS-19, uh, the developer will, will be required to develop a storm water plan strategy. This development is the lowest property in the area and thus has a lot of existing natural drainage flow from other properties across it, which the developer will have to accommodate as well in its storm water plan. The change in zoning from parkland, open grass areas R4, large parking and roof surfaces accumulating more storm drainage will, be, will require the, the developer, civil engineering designer, to limit the flow of storm water from this site so as to not overwhelm the city storm system at the point of connection. Three phase or single phase electrical services available to the lot. Please note that pad mount transformer orders take a minimum of six months and can take up to a year. The contractor engineer should contact Summerside Electrical as soon as possible and require a signed letter of intent before an order is placed. The remaining portion of Tower Street Park 140 abutting the subject property will serve the development and the existing area. The park is accessible by street and walkway network. Parkland dedication would be required if the property was to be further subdivided. There is no intention to subdivide the subject property. Item G, impact of the development on pedestrian vehicle access and safety and on public safety generally. Staff comment, based on the additional daily volume of approximately 512 vehicles per day, the new development will add approximately 10% additional traffic flow to Brophy Avenue. See the calculations attached to this report, and there is a traffic report attached. The total traffic volume of this development and the existing developments is approximately 16.8% of the street's available capacity. A new cul-de-sac will be constructed to accommodate the access for this development and provide an emergency slash service vehicle turnaround for all buildings located on the upper portion of Brophy Avenue. There is an existing sidewalk on the south side of Brophy Avenue. As well, this portion of Brophy Avenue has been widened to the city standard, allowing adequate paved shoulder to accommodate pedestrian traffic for the existing and future development. Traffic flow within the development will be reviewed prior to development. Item H, compatibility of the uh, development with environmental, scenic, and heritage resources. Staff comment, there are no compatibility issues regarding environmental, scenic, or heritage resources. I, impacts on the city's finances and budgets. Not staff comment, not applicable. Other matters as specified by this bylaw. Staff comment, not applicable. Other matters as considered uh, uh, relative, relevant. Uh, staff comment, the subject property was zoned parkland. The surrounding lands were zoned R4 as of 1998. The city has a bylaw to address noise concerns during construction of the development or at any time. Councillor Snow requested the real estate listing information about the timing of the property being listed on the market. The timeline for how the property came to be listed is detailed as follows. On July 6, 2019, the CFO, the Chief Financial Officer of the City, was approached uh, by a local developer about the possibility of purchasing Brophy property. CFO advised this will be discussed with Council. The developer is advised that the City is interested in selling. It would have to go through a public process to do so. On July 25th, 2019, uh, CFO emails count, emailed council to advise of the developer's interest in the property, and this will be discussed on July 29th, the Committee of the Whole. On July 29th, 2019, Committee of the Whole, council agrees to list the property contingent on a council-approved development agreement within a certain period of time. July 31st, 2019, uh, 
Royal LePage is approached about the possibility of selling this land on behalf of the city. He engaged to this engagement on August 5th. On November 6, 2019, the property is listed for sale. The reason for the three month gap between the hiring of the realtor and the actual listing of the property is that the uh, city initially wanted to have an up to date property survey on file before listing. However, given the inability to hire a surveyor without having to wait uh, for a period of time, two to four months, it was decided to proceed with the listing with the caveat that the sale was subject to a completed survey. This property has been listed ever since and the listing has not been taken down as of this time. At any time, excuse me, yeah. Um, staff review. City staff supports the application initiated by the City of Summerside to rezone from parkland to R4. As per section 5.10B uh, subsection 3 of the zoning bylaw, the Planning Board should make a recommendation to Council on this application before it is approved or denied. And the uh, Planning Board recommendation, whether mm -hmm. carried or defeated, will be brought forward to Council for a final decision. So before we get into the recommendation, I'll read the attachments here. Uh, the traffic impacts on Brophy, there's a chart there uh, that shows the traffic counts and uh, the volumes that we spoke about in the, in the verbiage there. Um, <clears throat> we'll move on then to um, the email from Jamie Rogerson, dated February 25th to Rob Philpot. Um, hey Rob, thanks for the conversation yesterday. As we discussed, I think the future with this type of situation, in the future of this type of situation would be a great idea to let the Vela's propose the projects in discussion to any residents in attendance before receiving the opposition speeches. It's hard for the public to speak with a clear understanding of a project if they don't have the information. I didn't feel Tuesday was a place to debate on my end after the McGinnises were on the podium first. They are for fearful they could lose tenants to newer, more modern and accessible buildings, which I understand, but that is the reality of any business. The rooftop terrace and views would be pretty amazing. But nobody is talking about the need, which is the big ticket. There is so much surrounding the need for viable development, which have low environmental impact, are sustainable and affordable, which is what we offered in our proposal to the city. We haven't spoken about the fact we reevaluated the plan once to accommodate more park space than originally proposed. The fact that big business is doing research on where there is housing availability before they set up shop in a city like ours, build it and they will come, has been a model used for decades. And in this, and in this use, housing needs to be built and business will follow. There's tax dollars and spin-off from projects of this nature, which give the city a tax base to use for further development of infrastructure. That is useful for all families and seniors initiatives, heritage properties, etc. When your city isn't growing, it's dying. Right now, we're still growing, but not on the track for, develop, for the development plan produced in April of last year. Everyone wants development, but nobody wants it in their backyards. I've lived it. When St. Clair was built, I didn't want my neighborhood filled with duplexes. I was fearful it would impact the value of my property long term. My street was originally a loop, now the throughway to Water Street. But I knew it was the right thing to do and the right thing for the city. In turn, it has been a beautiful addition to the Lafergie subdivision and I, in turn, received a large quantity of work out of that street during the development phase, and even now during snow removal season, and I'm glad the buildings are now where they are. It has introduced new families to our area and new friends to our family. Development is a good thing. It can be messy, loud, and inconvenient, but it always will be regardless of the area. 
and the finished product is most always beautiful. I haven't made it as far as I have in business by making ill-informed decisions. It being the positives, and I've always followed the big picture. My work ethic, my care for my customers, my person. My willingness to give back through donation and volunteer work. I am not just a business person. I am a thriving member of our city, both in business and community event and plan to use the same values I've instilled in life to this project. I am a perfectionist and my own biggest critic, and these buildings would be my baby, like everything else I'm invested, invested to. The short-term inconvenience to construction rarely outweighs the long-term benefit to residents and cities. We are crying for housing but it's time we stop sharing it on Facebook articles about it and be proactive with the opportunities we have in front of us. I guess in closing, I just wish I could have had the opportunity to speak to these residents about all the great things about our buildings, right from its size and the reasons behind it to its future capabilities. All of the things our city is doing as done for healthy lifestyle initiatives, including the Friendship Park, the Boardwalk, et cetera, uh, which isn't far away and the closest thing to true nature in any of our surrounding areas. Uh, thanks again, Jamie. Uh, we had an email on uh, February 25th as well to the No, no, will this go to you, Rob, or to Linda? Oh, to okay. To, oh, excuse me, yeah. Good morning. As a resident of Summerside and Concerned City, I'm running on behalf of my parents who live at 21-391 uh, Brophy Avenue, Summerside. It has come to our attention that the green space is being uh, sold to a developer pending the application of it being rezoned to R4. We are all very concerned and disappointed that this space is even being considered for rezoning, but for there to be four, four level structures housing 128 units being squeezed into that small area is outrageous. We feel the area would be better suited for a much smaller development with a combined entry exit. I'm sure there is other land available in the city that could better accommodate such a project. My parents and many others in their building and in the uh, neighboring buildings have chosen to live in this area because it is predominantly senior area. It is a quiet and peaceful area and the green space is often used by visiting grandchildren. Many had been assured that the green space would never be developed, ensuring their remaining days of independent living will be tranquil and quiet. Now, now, if this proceeds, they will be living in the center of what could be uh, very well constant traffic and noise. The entrance to the new structure apparently being on one end of their building, the exit at the other end. Does this seem fair for residents to be stuck in the middle of that? It seems there is no consideration for the current residents at all. The proposed development is planned to take four years to complete. That will be four years of constant traffic, consisting mostly of large trucks and excavating equipment. The summers will be constant dust and noise. There's no air conditioning in their building. So can you imagine what it will be like in sweltering, humid weather and not being able to open a window? That is a cruel and unhealthy way to exist. It's certainly no way to treat our seniors. Surely there can be more thought into where this proposed project could be located. It is bad enough to lose precious green space within the city. And if affordable housing units must go there, can it, be, can it not be smaller, can it not be similar structures to what is already there? A single level structure with a combined entrance exit that would uh, be so much less intrusive and overbearing to many long-term residents of 30, or 391 Bro Brophy Avenue. Thank you for your time, Helen Clevett, 51 Brandon Carter Avenue, on behalf of Orville and Dorothy Can of 21-391 uh, Brophy Avenue. An email to Councillor Barb Ramsey, Mayor and CAO. 
date it February 25th to Councilwoman Ramsey, Mayor and Council. As a resident and a constituent in your municipal area, I'm writing this with high concerns for our beautiful green space the city is looking to rezone to multiple R4. I have lived beside the construction of Andrew Lodge addition for two years. It was horrific, but I lived with it to benefit more seniors home care, but they still have not cleaned up their back space after three years and three attempts with them. There is a pile of garbage left. Uh, it is a, a great place to hibernate skunks, mice, earwigs every spring. The last three years we have basically been shut-ins with COVID-19. Now with this rezoning, the city wants us to become further victims of dust, noise, and all kinds and all hours. The traffic will be beyond what you or I can comprehend. Now getting down to the most important part, the safe green space with those beautiful trees and children's play area. This wonderful space is used by many children day and after dark and feel safe alone and also with parents and grandchildren and pets. I would like to know if council will be able to guarantee their safety, which they have now, if or when this R4 may be completed. The residents of 391 Brophy will have their sun blocked off and, uh, and just buildings to look at. Great for the mind of seniors with the beginning of dementia. Being a certified life coach, how do you think uh, will affect everyone? Just one question. Does the city need to sell the land to help pay for the construction of the balloon and propane for the winter? And the, muni and the municipal election, I believe, is in November 2022. Respectfully, yours, Marilyn Dawson Barlow. Email to Councillor Ramsey. Read the public meeting. We are unable to attend the meeting regarding the plans for the green space on Brophy Avenue. We wish to not have any more low income apartments. There is plenty all around us. With the low income apartments uh, comes a lot of problems for a quiet neighborhood. We also enjoy the quietness of our dead end street, uh, dead end of road housing. May we suggest using the entrance on Tower Street by the park so you could make it a four-way stop and they could access the apartment from there and yes we know it is by a park and a fence would easily block out the traffic which will only be access for the apartments thank you for hearing our concerns Ter terry ling gallant uh, 382 brophy avenue and then we also had the uh the uh notes from uh the residents of uh, 376 Duke Street and uh, 391 and 388 Brophy Avenue, the 32 residents that have signed those. Those were already read into the public record and uh, as well as the, uh, the ones from uh, Chesapeake Heights that were read into the public record. Additionally, since this package was put together, we have received a number of other letters that I will read into the public. Uh, record. This one is from the Bayside Group. To whom it may concern, I was discussing with Jamie Rogerson his concerns regarding proposed development on Upper Brophy Street. I understand there may be some public opposition, so I wanted to express my support for this development. With housing crisis and lack of inventory in rental market, it is crucial we open the doors to developers. Jamie and his team represent where I was 25 years ago, having gone through three applications in our city for rezones for multi-unit development, representing 50 plus units, and uh, with the expense, disincentive, and messaging and resulting negativity, I concluded I would never apply for a rezone in our city again, and have not. Can we imagine if we had to embrace 20 years ago, our proposed developments, we would have another 100 or more citizens in our city. When a few concerned citizens get to determine, based on emotion or fear, what gets developed in our city always left me wondering why we had a planning department. 
Please, councillors, realize that the market has changed and continues to change. I suggest we embrace these changes while maintaining prudent planning. And we encourage and support young developers, investors in our city. Signed by Peter Brown of uh, Bayside Group. Continuing on. already read Councillor or uh, uh, Ms. Barlow's, in, Marilyn Barlow's into the record. Make sure you're not missing one here. No, we got that. Okay. We have a letter dated February 28th. Dear Council Members, unfortunately I was not able to attend the uh, Council meeting on February 23rd, 2022 and will also be unavailable for the meeting on March 1st, 2022. But I would like to speak in support of the rezoning of the proposed Brophy Street development. I lived on Brophy Street for 10 years. Okay. I lived on Brophy Street for 10 years with my parents and have lived on Driscoll Street for the past 20 years with my family. My children have moved on with their post-secondary education and are now back living at home due to the shortage of uh, satisfactory accommodations. At this stage in their lives, they are not ready to buy a home and have considered moving to larger cities like Charlottetown and Moncton where apartments are more readily available. As kids, this was certainly not a place, a piece of property we use as a leisure destination with green space from Elm Street School being so close by. I do not foresee any negative impact on placing a development in, of this nature in my neighborhood. Best regards, Derek Cameron, 361. Driscoll Street. Okay, City Council, uh, rezoning of property Brophy. Dear City Council, this letter to express my support for the proposed rezone of Brophy Street to house 432 unit buildings. I have seen firsthand the situation of the scarceness of rental properties in and around Summerside. People are struggling to find affordable, suitable housing and leaving the city to do so. And leaving the city to do so. Proposed increase in density is a necessary component to Summerside's housing crisis and success to our city. Also, to provide accessible or partially accessible net zero capability along with affordable housing is a welcome sight and much needed addition to our community. In conclusion, I urge you to vote yes on this project because it is the kind of redevelopment that is good for Summerside neighborhood and good for the economy in general. And that's signed by, uh, sincerely by Wallace McCausland. And we have one here to Councillor Barb Ramsey on March 1st, uh, also sent to the Mayor and City Council. Uh, and this is from Logan McClellan. Hey Barb, I'm sorry to bother you on a holiday. I just recently uh, watched the public council meeting from last week regarding the attached project off Brophy. I understand there is another one tonight, so I wanted to reach out beforehand. I've been reading a lot on this project and also had several people reach out to me in regards. My opinion, Council wouldn't be setting the right president to vote against something like this given the current circumstances of affordable housing and development in Summerside. I listen to both sides of the argument and still think uh, in the current despair of housing, moving forward on something like this is the best decision for our city and residents. That's just my two cents. I understand these decisions are hard to make. Keep up the good work and, and that's from Logan McClellan. I have another one from, <coughs> excuse me, from Sally McKinley. Dear Mayor and all uh, City of Summerside councillors, my name is Sally McKinley and I have been residing at Independence Place since 2015. I was fortunate to be able to reside here because at that time I qualified because I was a senior citizen. And I also was a caregiver to my son, Joey Arsenal, who was wheelchair bound. I was a weekend caregiver once a month along with family gatherings. I truly like living here because of great neighbors and the area this building was built in. I'm now very concerned after learning that four houses, four stories high, totaling a total of 128 tenants, 
in the green space, which is right behind Independence Place. Summerside's growing, and that's wonderful. It's the size of the proposed building and the number of tenants that will be housed there is my concern, along with other tenants of in Independence Place. This is a zone green space that is for families and kids to come to. Yes, there will still be a small place for the park in the same place where at least 128 cars will be parked. That is not suitable, and this will now create a safety issue. Also, the height of the building will block the sun and will feel overwhelming for uh, anybody who lives close to it. Also, the congestion of traffic in a small community in this one small space will be overwhelming. It's so not a fit for this type of community. The proposal sounds wonderful for a space way bigger and maybe on the outskirts of the city. And my last pitch is for the building of it. Four years is a long time, which will contribute to a lot of noise and dust. Please, please consider all this in your vote. And if it was a building like ours or another apartment housing, a smaller amount, and all or all ground would uh, all gr ground floor would even be fine. Uh, but not four four-story buildings with 128 tenants. Green space are for kids and their families to, to, to go. Uh, let's not lose that. It's all part of what makes Summerside a great place for all. Uh, thanking you for listening to my concerns. Sally McKinley, 376 Duke Street. And this was an email to uh, Councillor Snow, forward on the rest of Council. And it's from uh, Justin Durash, uh, to whom it may concern with the City of Summerside, I'm running you regarding to the Brophy Avenue developments. I have many family and friends in the Summerside area who cannot find a decent place to rent as options are very limited. We indeed have a housing crisis on our hands when you look at the current real estate prices. There's nothing available. I encourage Council to approve this development to better serve the needs of our growing community. More housing in this area of the city would also benefit the businesses in this area. Justin Durash. Next one is uh, to Mayor Basil Stewart, copy the council, as well as the development officer and the CAO, etc. Um, this one was. Uh, here we go. Uh, I got all these email track here. Uh, hi, council members. Uh, my name is Ryan Reed. I live at uh, on Jennifer Street, just around the corner from proposed land rezoning on Brophy. Over the past number of years, I have been fortunate enough to take on a property management role with some of the newer developers in, in Summerside, and want to express my support for the rezoning. We have beautiful green spaces all over the city some regularly in use, like the Rotary Park, and some which is not, like the one on Brophy, which I pass every day, multiple times a day. There we go. I have had the opportunity to see and meet with residents uh, of a lot of these new developments firsthand and the consensus is always the same. People are happy to have found residency at all and they're completely overwhelmed to finally be able to have something new. People take pride in being able to be a part of the new development. Families are happy to have found refuge in a nice place like Summerside. Retirees are happy to have downsized and let someone else maintain their repairs and maintenance and overall it's good for business, for the shops, the restaurants, and venues we have uh, in place here. And it is good for contractors and sub-trades. We need to continue to find housing for people, and I believe it would be in the best interest of the people to move a project like this forward in Summerside. And that's sincerely, Ryan Reed. Okay, and we have another one here uh, from, uh, I think it went to uh, Councillor Ramsey. Um, Hi, Barb. Thank you in advance for taking the time to read this. I'm contacting you today to show my support for the low-income housing project being proposed for Summerside. The city of Summerside desperately needs this to go forward. 
not only to help the city grow, but to assist its residents in being able to live a prosperous life. Housing costs are becoming a huge concern for a lot of Canadians these last couple of years, and if there is someone willing to do something to help alleviate these concerns for residents, it has my full support. And that is from uh, Evan Simmons. I don't have an address for Evan there. And then we have one from the Enterprise Venture Group. Uh, City of Summerside, March 1st. Good afternoon, all. As a fellow developer, I'd like to express my support for the proposal submitted by Mr. Jamie Rogerson of Upfront Developments for R4 Housing on Brophy Avenue. As we all know, housing is in short supply. Therefore, this project is a much needed addition to the community. I would also like to commend each and every one of you for doing your part in keeping as, as much future development as possible within city boundaries and for having the foresight to list, to list uh, developable city-owned vacant land, thereby turning an annual expense for the city into an annual revenue stream. At a time when costs are increasing dramatically, these are prudent financial decisions, and that's signed by Donna McKay of Enterprise Venture Group. And we're getting a couple more. We're getting there. Um, this one uh, came in in March 1st as well, and uh, was to uh, the mayor, subject parkland, dear Mayor Basil Stewart, good afternoon. Uh, Mr. Mayor, thank you for a few moments of your busy time. I'm writing to you about the possible rezoning of our beautiful little area of park that lies between Tower Street and Brophy Avenue. I live at 390 Brophy and I am on the left hand side of our building. I look out my patio doors right on the park and I sit out on nice evenings and see the children running and playing in the top part of the park as well as people walking about in the park. I also walk down Brophy Avenue and walking back home through the park, so this park is enjoyed by many people. As I am sure you are aware, uh, this is a dead-end street and it is also quite narrow, especially around a somewhat blind curve and I am concerned about the safety of us all if there is over 100 cars added to what we now have, as well as delivery vans, school buses, and visitors, etc., I, uh, I am also concerned with the extra noise that will be there with four plus years of construction, the dust that will be present, and after construction with the added amount of people that will be well over 200 people to a nice, quiet, and peaceful retirement. I'm asking you to please consider the feelings of all of us up here where we are 90% seniors and leave us with our green space, our quiet, peace and safety, the reason that we chose this area in the first place. And that's signed by Anna Johnston. And they keep on coming in, just got this one a minute ago, uh, which I'll read into the, the record here. Uh, Mayor and Council. As a housing developer investor in our community, this project on Brophy Avenue is desperately needed to help with housing. The only way to push down rent prices and housing prices is more inventory. It's the only way out of this. To put together this type of investment in Summerside is tough. So for this company to be able to do so is well needed for the community. So I warn you not to waste this opportunity to add to the housing stock. Trust me, I know the capital markets uh, and Summerside is tough to get capitalized for big projects. Summerside needs to seize this opportunity. The group putting together the project, I have had the opportunity to work with them and can tell you they are great people with good vision for Summerside. Although we all can appreciate Bill McGinnis' comments and complaints. Ask yourself this, when is the last time Bill put a new building in Summerside? Oh wait, all of his new ones went to Charlottetown. Let's back the guys who are willing to invest today in the city, not those who invested 20 years ago. Respectfully, Tyler McDonald, Will Mack Construction. So those are all the letters that 
officially, I think, came to the city. I don't know if any others came to any councillors that haven't been read into the record. If, if so, uh, I, I know there's been many, many phone calls. I've received several phone calls, both both pro and, 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 and con, um, uh, but we don't put those in the official record. Those are just uh, calls to councillors. So uh, before we put the recommendation on the floor, do you have something? Um, I, I think you just said it, and I believe every councillor has. He, um, took many calls from the residents as well as developers. And uh, I just indicated to all of them, and for some that I didn't call back, there were so many, but we tried to give callbacks to as many folks as we could, and we appreciate that. Okay, so the planning board recommendation we'll go back to, and we'll need to get that moved and second it, and then we'll open the floor for discussion. So uh, the planning board recommendation, the application initiated by the city of Summerside for a portion of PID number 322339 to amend the city of Summerside zoning bylaw from parkland P zone to high density residential R4 zone be recommended to be approved by council. Uh, do we have a mover for that from treasury board? Or excuse me, treasury board. <laughs> <laughs> Wherever I'm at. Planning board. Moved by Councillor Adams. Do we have a seconder? Yeah, I'll second to get to seconded the council. Seconded by the mayor, so we have it on the floor. And just to explain to people, uh, the motion's on the floor, so it'll either be passed, or if it's passed, it will go to, uh, to council uh, with the recommendation that is endorsed by planning board. If the motion is defeated, it would go to council without the endorsement of planning board, but it would still go to council. The final decision rests with council. Uh, so with that, I will open the floor to any councillors that might have questions or points. Uh, Councillor Duron. Thank you, Councillor McFeely. I just wanted to add on what uh, Deputy Mayor McCollman said. And just with regards to the volume and quantity of phone calls and messages that were left, um, I just wanted to put out there that I too received lots of calls and uh, lots of voicemails and that I've trying to be I've been trying to return them in the order that they've been uh, coming in but as we approached meeting time today there's still a few left so just if anybody's here or if anybody's watching or listening and and left me a message uh, and I didn't get back to you yet uh, I will <laughs> there, there was a lot so just wanted to you know let everybody know that I'm sure I'm not the only one around the room that uh, that uh, has been experiencing it, but just want to let you know that they're not, uh, your calls aren't falling on uh, on deaf ears, just uh, it's a big inbox to get through, so <laughs> it's been, we keep it's returning been, those calls. Yeah, there really has been a tremendous volume of calls. I was thinking about this this morning, isn't it a, a wonderful thing that we live in a place that we can express these views and, and uh, have this debate and this discussion when you see the other things going on in the world. Uh, many people don't have this opportunity to, to have the discussion. So, any other comments? Uh, I do, uh, and I'm not sure um, if it's my turn. Uh, it's Barb here, but uh, whenever you're ready to call on me, uh, Councilman McFeely, I'd like to say a few words. Well, your floor is yours. I can't see your hand up, so we'll have to go with that. Well, thank you, and um, welcome everybody this evening. Uh, uh, my co-counselors, Mayor Stewart, and everybody who's attending this evening. Thank you um, for all the interest that has been um, received on this topic. And, um, you know, it's been probably one of the most difficult um, challenges for me um, as, a, <laughs> as a counselor since, since day one. Um, it is, uh, this, this situation is happening in Ward 3. Um, every, which is my ward, everybody, um, all councillors have, have expressed uh, the number of phone calls and letters and, you know, so many that we can't return them. So we know um, that, that there are many, many uh, concerns, uh, some for uh, the, the rezoning and, of course, some not for the rezoning. Um, as, as for me, um, you are my ward. I have spoken with so many. Um, over, I'm sure there's over, well over 100 people who, who contacted me one way or another. Um, I, and, and it's not about the housing for me. 
because we do need housing in Summerside. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. And I totally, totally support housing and always have, and I always will. This has nothing to do with the housing part. This part of the meeting is whether we want to rezone our green space into our four. What people have been telling me is that they don't want to lose their green space. Many, many, many seniors are enjoying it, um, whether they look at it, whether they look at the trees, whether they're able to walk over there and just enjoy a little stroll um, and watch the children play in the park. Um, so that's the kind of feedback I'm getting from my residents and I, I can't go against them as far as the green space is concerned because once we let that green space go, we're not getting it back. And you know, there, there is the small park there right now and there's elementary school, the Elm Street School, and there is some green space over there, um, the park and you know, but, but it's, it's a school zone. And um, so really what those seniors have is that, that little bit of green space that is there so I just want to put that out there and ask council, all council members and mayor to consider that. Um, and um, I, I do, as far as my residents are concerned, I have to, I have to agree to, you know, they want to keep their green space and I have to support that. So that's, um, that's all I have to say right now. Thank you, Councillor Ramsey. Any other comments? Councillor McDougall. <clears throat> Thank you. I think everybody can see me. I'm sitting down, but <laughs> I don't know if you see me if I'm standing up. So, uh, thank you, Councillor McFeely. I, I, you know, this is the challenge when we when we uh, get to be councillors. This this is a big decision that's that's going to take place, and thankfully, we, I as a councillor don't have to vote on it tonight. I know the planning board does, but I. Uh, I'm really torn on this one, and I'll tell you the reason why. I, uh, I received a lot of calls. I received uh, messages, and some of the messages I haven't returned because, and I couldn't answer, because I was on the, uh, I'm, I'm on the FCM, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities uh, uh, National Board, and we have our board meetings last week, and uh, I just had one before I come in here. so. And last week I was asked to set on the National Housing Summit, Supply Summit for, for housing. We had the National Minister of Housing and Diversity on that meeting. And uh, I just wanna say that FCM is probably one of the biggest and greatest lobbyists in, in Canada. And uh, they work very closely with the federal government to work on projects and one of the uh, one of the top priorities for FCM, uh, working with uh, the government to coming up to this next budget, is housing. There's a national housing crisis in this country, and uh, you know, here in PEI, we just been uh, given the census, and we're one of the fastest growing uh, provinces in Canada. Uh, there is a, a, a supply problem, and uh, you know, as councillors, we need to uh, we need to address that. Um, the other side, you know, five or six years ago, uh, we'd be on our knees looking for developers to come to our city. Now we have them here, and we have to come up with these decisions. It's in a tough it's a tough decision, and I, I you know, I. I was sitting there today and I'm thinking, you know, what would I do? What would be my position if I was in Chesapeake or anywhere up around there? And I gotta go back to being a counselor. What's the best thing for the city? And what's the best thing for the residents? And like I said, I'm sure glad I don't have to, to vote on it tonight because I got a lot of thinking to do. But uh, I just wanted to throw that thing out there with the national housing uh, because we, we do have a problem and we're gonna have a problem uh, down the road, so thank you. Councillor Snow. Thank you, Councillor McFeely. And, and just uh, pretty much to echo what uh, Councillor McDougall was just saying, 
uh, received lots of calls and uh, had lots of chats when either at the hockey game or going down the street with people as they everybody sort of read up on what was going on with the rezoning and and uh, it, it really has been uh, pretty much 50 50 coming in where there's a majority of people that support it and realize the need for housing and then um, people in the area who definitely uh, oppose it um, I'm a big believer in supply and demand and and right now our supply is down and until we uh, bring that supply chain up I think we'll continue to have uh, rates that are not achievable for most people in the city of Summerside so we have to find a way to uh, have development in our city um, we have we keep talking about wanting to expand our industrial uh, area and, and get more jobs and and better paying jobs and so on within our city but until we increase the uh, number of people we have living in our city the talent base that businesses can draw from then then nobody will want to come here that that's just the way reality works supply and demand so right now we have developers in front of us like Councillor McDougall said who who want to invest in our city and I would the only caution I would have for all council is if we do not uh, decide to approve this, we better be working very hard to figure out what or how we can make this development remain within our city because if not, it's gonna go to Charlottetown and the people will go to Charlottetown or will go to Kensington and people will live in Kensington. We really need to keep drawing people to our city. Um, we need that to keep the tax base down for all the residents that are paying taxes within our city. There's lots of reasons why we have to uh, continue to develop. So um, it is a very tough decision. Uh, I, don't, I don't like receiving calls where, where people are against it and you have to, you know, take their calls and, and you know, I, I totally understand what everybody is uh, saying. It, it I, I hate having to uh, go against one side or the other, but but that's part of being a counselor and that's why we uh, did this. But one thing I uh, said to myself when I got elected is that when I leave here, I wanna be uh, somebody that's respected and, and never did anything I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't uh, be ashamed of or, or not have done either way. So I, I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm taking in all the information I know there was lots of sort of maybe insinuations or discussion around the decision has already been made and I can tell you from this counselor there's been no decision made and I respect everybody's opinion and, and I continue like <laughs> Councilor McDougall I'm glad I'm not making a decision tonight but I'll continue to look through the information and, and see where we go. So that voting date again for the record is for all council? Monday March 21st. Monday, March 21st, at what time? 6.30. 6.30. Any other comments? Uh, Councillor Campbell, and then we have somebody from the public that does this. As long as it's new information that we haven't heard. It's an email I sent, but it wasn't written. It wasn't written. Oh, no, certainly, certainly. Yeah. Uh, do you have it with you? Uh, you can read it in or I can read it in for you, whatever you prefer. I'll, I can give it to you and you can read it. Okay. <laughs> no, no, we'll certainly. Uh, yeah. Well, it's like I say, there's been. There's been a lot come through and uh, we've tried to capture the ones that came so you know if it didn't get through I don't know. Just for the record I have a Colleen Cameron in my spam so <laughs> if you want to <laughs> yeah it's in my spam so if everybody wants to see that it's so it's so in I, my, as soon as you said that my, I thought. It's in my spam as well I just found it. So it went to everybody's spam apparently but anyways good news is we have it now and we will certainly read it into the record so. Um, hello, my name is uh, Colleen Cameron. Uh, I am the owner, along with my husband, Philip Cameron, of 391 Brophy, 388 Brophy, 376 Duke Street, 
Independence Place and 445-447 Tower Street. These seven apartment buildings surround the city park land and on all four sides and are exclusively rented to seniors. I am here today to submit my input on the rezoning of the city park land proposal that the city of Summerside is considering. As a property owner who has purchased property surrounding a green space, I am frustrated that the city of Summerside would allow for high density building on parkland. Parkland, which is directly situated in the backyard of buildings that were purposely built for seniors of Summerside. Because of this large and quiet green space, this area of Summerside has become a very senior-oriented senior area. The city of Summerside has expressed again and again how they are a senior-friendly city, yet they are proposing to allow a developer to build high density on a piece of city-owned parkland that will disrupt the whole atmosphere of what has been going on in this area for the past 20 years. I do not think it is showing any respect to the people that have sold their houses to rent and retire in this area and no respect to those property owners who chose to invest in this area of Summerside. The people who live in this area felt secure in knowing that their home was built situated next to a parkland and it would not be developed and bring in with it uh, more noise and increased traffic. As a property owner who works hard to meet the many needs of our tenants, the rezoning of this land is an action that cannot be recovered from. It will disturb the quiet enjoyment of my own seven apartment buildings and the other senior buildings in the area. I propose to the City of Summerside that the process begin in the reversed order. Step one uh, would be to draft a letter up and dis distribute it around to the surrounding area to people who have a vested interest in that area and see what the census is uh, to turn this land from parkland uh, that apartments can be constructed. Step two, if the consensus is that people want to, uh, re want it to remain parkland, do not sell it. Step three, I believe the city needs to rethink this and go through a different process other than trying to get as many units as possible in an area. No matter if it fits with the other buildings or not, or if it interferes with the building. Example, 391 Brophy, uh, to have the entrances and exit on either side of the building means there will be cars constantly circling this building like the Indy 500. Not nice. I am here as a developer and as a taxpayer as well. We have been in this city for our whole lives and tried to do the best we could in this community. We do not usually object to many things, but I feel to turn this area from a nice quiet area into a high density area with more traffic, noise, etc., is not fair to the people living here. There is a lot more to look at there than the dollars. We need to look at the seniors who live here, not ignore them. In our city, I know there is a need for housing. However, uh, do we have to ruin the housing that is in place already to obtain new housing? or develop new housing in an area more suited for it. There seems to be a lot of units uh, going to be coming into the market. For example, Arsenal Brothers are building 134 units in the East End of Summerside. There's supposed to be 32 units for low-income families in the former Somers uh, Somerset Manor site. Another 59 units are planned for Water Street East by Nathan Kember. I heard of a new development by Sunny's Dairy Bar. So there are new housing coming into that market. Why do we have to take away parkland and ruin a lot of people's living when there are obviously more developments going to happen in our city? I propose to start to develop on the outskirts of the city so as not to overflood our water and sewer systems and have extra traffic in the side streets of the city. From Colleen Cameron and Philip Cameron, uh, Cameron Apartments, and we thank you for that, Colleen. I wish you would have read it. You probably sound much better than I would read it, so thank you. Thank you. And we have another one. It was in the junk folder as well, apparently. Is that apparently. from Ash? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I was just going to say, yeah. Received a little bit. <coughs> it was from an Ashley Arsenal, and it was received in the junk folder on March 1st. Uh, if you've never held the hand of a mother who was trying to turn her life around after being raised in a chaotic uh, 
drug-fueled environment while she cries about the lack of affordable housing for herself and her young children, you don't understand the true need for affordable housing. If you never help someone pack up their things to donate to the Salvation Army while they prepare to live on the streets or in a shelter, you don't understand the need for affordable housing. If you've never had to liquidate your belongings so you can afford to put a roof over your head, you don't understand the true need for affordable housing. Never been in any of the, these scenarios? Consider yourself lucky. Too much of our Summerside population cannot stay the same. Having been in a position to support individuals suffering through the above listed scenarios, I can assure you that I understand the ripple effect of a lack of affordable housing. First, someone can't afford the rent. Then they're forced to live in unfit, non-safe conditions just to avoid sleeping in a tent. Then child protection services knocking on their door to take their children. And I bet you can imagine what happens next. The parent spirals and develops a dependency on their drug of choice. The child is misplaced and gets lost in the foster care system. And so the heartbreaking cycle repeats itself for generations to come. At what point do we as society take accountability to turning a blind eye to this ever so obvious crisis? We hear leaders talk about helping their people as though it's their top priority. Yet too often I've seen them be more concerned about the wants of the rich than the need of the poor. How can you call yourself a leader when you're pushing down your people instead of helping lift them up towards a better, brighter future for themselves and their children? I'm certain that most people who are against the rezoning of the property at hand are concerned about the kind of people who would be moving uh, into affordable housing. They're likely assuming that they will bring violence and drugs to the area that they cherish. But I bet they're forgetting one very important detail. These people are human. These people have wants and needs, visions and goals. Do we forget that people do the best with what they have? Maybe if we kept that in mind, we would ensure that we're doing what we can to con contribute to their success. Summerside does not need more green space for people to pitch their tents in the freezing cold. Summerside needs more affordable housing, and that's from Ashley Arsenal. Uh, so, what do we have? Was, uh, Councillor McDougall. Was there one read from Wallace McCausland? Yes, there was. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, so I, I, I hope we captured all the, the written uh, submissions that we received. And uh, there's not more lying in some of these junk files somewhere. So I found all, all of those in mine too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Deputy Mayor. Yeah. Um, just before you did read the other last number of emails, Mr. Chair, I also want to just speak to the residents and anyone listening by live stream. Uh, certainly, it is a very difficult situation, and I think it's been. Uh, very much appreciated, and I think the chair pointed out if we if we lived in other parts of the world, we might not even have the freedom to speak up or say anything. So that's a good thing because we learn from each other so much. I represent Ward 6, and I know just really in the last year, year or two, we have had apartment complexes built in that area, and some of the, the very same comments that we are hearing concerning this application, many of the residents and many of the people did speak to that as well as, as, well as developers and business people. The area that I represent is the downtown Center East, the Old Town Ward, and uh, some of the, the older homes, the shipbuilding homes and the historic areas. So I think for people it was very hard to see apartment buildings going up. But I just want to draw on the point I have not made any decisions and uh, certainly respecting all of the opinions and, and calls and emails that people have spoken. I think. What we struggle with a lot of the times is just as Councillor Bruce has said about the national housing crisis, tr crisis trying to make sure that there is enough uh, living stock, apartments, townhouses, duplexes for people. And I think everything that we've received, and I was very pleased that the residents heard tonight 
just how the real estate listing took place because that was something that was not done willy-nilly and I think you could see by the timeline and the dates how that was published and how it went about. And I think that's what makes it really hard for council is because we really need to hear and represent what is the greater good for Summerside while we listen to our residents. So I just hope that the uh, residents that are here in the gallery and those that are listening that they realize that this is not a done deal. It's not something that's been pre-decided. We have to weigh all of this information and really take it personally and really weigh out everything that has been said. So that's where I'm at on it, just really wanting to consider it very carefully. Thank you, Your Worship. Okay. Oh, sorry, no. Oh, there there is one more <laughs> in the junk mail. It was down further. I just sort of went through mine. It was. It came in the other day. Um, Do you want to read it into the I, record there? If it makes Counselor sense. Uh, so it's from Kevin Crozier. It says, His Worship, Mayor Stewart, esteemed Summerside Council members, I was recently made aware of a proposed building project which is seeking approval for rezoning in the Brophy Street area by Jamie Rogerson. My understanding is that this proposal is for four 32-unit buildings, which are a mix of one- and two-bedroom units. Included in this project is a provision for affordable housing units. Units. We all know how much these are needed. I understand the designs are well thought out, being accessible, net zero, or net zero capable, with rooftop solar panels that are well in line with the green approach that this city has been investing in and promoting. With the housing crisis that we are seeing with both lack of units and rising prices in Summerside specifically, and PEI overall, I believe this would be a wonderful addition to this neighborhood and the city as a whole. While I reside in the Fergie subdivision, I'm frequently in the area of this proposed development, having friends on Elm Street and Brophy Street itself. In addition, I'm also a member owner of Summerside Mosaic Temple Company located at 425 Maple Avenue, which also houses a thriving daycare. Jamie is a determined young man who I have known since I coached him in soccer in PEISAA. When Jamie went into business for himself, I did not hesitate to call on him for jobs on my property. His professionalism and attention to detail is something that we all should be proud of in a young entrepreneur in our city. I ask that the full consideration be given very worthwhile project and the rezoning required to move it forward that will no doubt be a winner for the city, the residents, the neighborhood, the entrepreneur and mayor and council with wisdom and foresight that, with wisdom and foresight to see that in that in keeping with the very ideas it has established. Sincerely, Kevin Crozier, 204 Crozier Drive. Okay, thank you, Councillor Snow, for reading that into the record. So hopefully we now have gotten all the, uh, all the submissions. So, Your Worship, you Just had- Just a, a comment. It will be on March the 21st is the official vote. That will be at the monthly meeting yeah. at 6.30 for Councillors to vote and discuss it if they want to debate it more or talk about it, but that it will be going to council for a full vote on that date and at 6:30. Uh, again, if we, I think you missed the start of the meeting, Jamie. But the uh, if you have <coughs> new new information to bring to the table, we'd love to hear it. But yeah, I yeah. just wanted to, to add. Yeah. Um, there was a petition started. It wasn't started by me, but. I'm writing to you today in regards to a recent council meeting held on February 23rd, 2022, which I watched via YouTube, more specifically in regards to the proposed development of the multiple rental units being potentially developed in the Elm Street, Brophy Street area of Summerside. My young family and I have owned a home in Summerside for 12 years now, for approximately, for approximately 12 years now. When you own a home, it is easy to turn a blind eye to what is going on around you in these trying economic times, hardships and housing shortages. Recently, my family has finally got to a point of barely making ends meet due to the ongoing issues of COVID impacts, financial hardships. For those reasons, we have had to sell, I'm 
and just it's screenshot it because my phone died. I had to send it to Brody. Um, for those reasons, we have had to sell our home. This is not a situation where we made last minute decisions. For months leading up to the inevitable circumstances, we have been looking for a rental for our family. We have applied with all the major housing rentals in Summerside, including, including Hillcrest Housing, Cameron Apartments, Slum Park Corporation, and Jennifer Street Apartments. And we're going, so we're skipping again here for a second. Uh, and we're going to have positive equity on the future sale of our home. We had even offered to pay a year's rent upon occupation of the unit. To our dismay, our young family with strong credit and willingness to be very flexible and the attitude of taking what we can get, our application went unanswered to all the aforementioned landlords. Having now seen firsthand the struggle people are going through on a daily basis to try to find housing, especially affordable housing for themselves and their families, I ask the council, please consider this blessing that is being brought forward by Mr. Rogerson and his plan for development on a major rental development in our city. Sincerely, Jeff Aristotle. And I, I just, there was a little bit of misinformation about the buildings themselves too. They're, they're definitely accessible to seniors and senior friendly too. They're not solely dedicated to seniors, but they're, they're more than capable of housing them. Uh, Jamie, That's all. Jamie, Thanks. Oh, yeah. sorry, just a question. Would you be able to forward that uh, petition to me so I make sure that it gets Absolutely. reflected? Absolutely. You, you can find it on change.org.com too if any of you guys want to look at it Perfect. before I get to that point. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, can I think can I ask Jamie a question? I, I didn't hear what he uh, said at the end about the housing. Yeah, you certainly can, Barb. Yeah, hi, Jamie. Hi, Barb. I can't see you. Hi, hi. Above me. I feel like I'm going to heaven with this oval of lights above me. <laughs> I'm not ready oh for my that goodness! Yet, um, just, go ahead. Just at the end, were you saying that most of these uh, units were going to be senior housing? I didn't hear what you said. So. Yeah, the, the units themselves, not all of them, but certainly a number of them, will be accessible as well, or, or we plan on having them accessible. So okay. they all have elevators and things like that, and uh, you know, it's it, they're not dedicated senior buildings. Um, I don't know how you can necessarily do that right now, but um, they're certainly welcome to live there a well amongst the, the rest of the population. Right, and they're one and two bedrooms. Is that something that um, you stated there earlier as well? Yeah, they're a mix of one and two bedrooms. A lot of the feedback that we've been getting kind of when this process started and through a lot of the communications with residents in the area and, and stuff like that, we found that people were paying for three bedroom units when they really only needed one or two because they were the only things available at the time. So if you're paying more um, more for rent, you're paying more rent for, for uh, rooms you don't really need. And a lot Space of people, you don't need. Yeah, exactly. And a lot of people aren't willing to rent out rooms in their house to subsidize their rental payment. Right. Okay. Thank you for answering that for me, Jamie. You're welcome. Thank okay, you. Bye -bye. And uh, I've seen Mr. Cameron's hand up. And if you have new information, Philip, we'd love to hear it. Thank you. And then I think we're probably in the position to go to the vote. So my name is Philip Cameron. I was here at the last meeting. I live at 423 Myrtle Street. And I do commend Jamie on what he's doing here. And we do need housing in the city. I was the one that had three properties adjacent to that parkland we're talking about. And I seen the land sitting there. And I say, who's gonna develop that land? And what's gonna happen to that land? I approached the city, and this is where we're at. We're really in a bidding war, me and Jim, Jamie. I didn't bid to buy the land. I didn't propose enough to get the land. I put a proposal out there to the city and it went public and the best vote or the best bid with the most houses and the biggest price got all the talk. My proposal hasn't been mentioned once here tonight. This is park land we're talking about. It was land that these people live in and yes, I was concerned about it, but I didn't know what the outcome was gonna become. And this is what it has become. It's become who can do the most. And everyone wants affordable housing. We need more. We want to get more to the city. We have two potential 
bu buildings on the go now, one at 708 Water Street and potentially one on Willow Street. We're trying to develop the city as well, but it's gotten out of hand as far as I'm concerned to lose it to 128 more units in my backyard where these people are already living and it was parkland and now it's gonna be a developed land that they don't know about. We as developers wanna develop it and I commend you, Jamie, to develop in Summerside, but do we need to take this parkland and develop it? One thing I found in the book that the city wrote up in 19, no, four years ago, section nine, page 159, Schedule B, Future Land Use Plan, your FLUP, FLUP, City of Summerside, Plan 2018, page 159. And on page 160 shows this land, this park land, and it's green, and it's green on the paper, and the future of Summerside was talking about their next 10 years. And this land was never spoken of for sale. It was never spoken of to put houses on, affordable or unaffordable, whatever people want to call them. But there is land in Summerside to be sold for these kind of developments. The top of Jennifer Street, Peter Brown sent in a letter. That was the city's land. It got sold off to a developer that isn't developing the land. It's sitting there empty. The city has Water Street, where the Summerside Bars was. That's supposed to be developed. It's not being developed. You want to talk about what's not being developed. Sonny's Dairy Bar, there's a big piece of land there. I don't know who owns it, but someone's supposed to be developing it. That's not park land. Those are developed land. Supposed to be developed. Who owns the property next to the building? Philip, no. Philip, so, can, I, can uh, I ask you a question? Sure. If you, if you don't mind, um, you said you came to the city, you were interested in that property? That's correct. Is that what, so what were you, can you, do you mind me asking what your plan was for that property, Philip? I really didn't have a plan. I was just approaching them, seeing what, what was, a, what, what, what were they going to do? What was up with it? What was going to go on? And the city asked me, what would I put on it? And then I was stunned saying, I don't know. I just want to see what's going on with the land. So I put in a proposal of 57 units, 227 units, because we're building one in Water Street. I needed to have a, uh, an idea how long it was going to take me to build it. I didn't even know, because we already got two projects on the go now. So it was kind of a rush, 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 and here it is on the market. Of course someone's going to put bids in on it to buy it. It's the most reasonable piece of land in Summerside to buy. Uh, where the old save easy was. Peter Brown has another piece of land there for sale. Develop, develop, develop. Those are seven, eight hundred thousand dollars. We got, this was on the market for three hundred and nineteen thousand dollars. I thought it was low myself, but I didn't get into a bidding war with somebody to buy parkland. I approached the city to see what they were doing with it, and now it's out in the open. Who wants to build the most units on it? It's kind of disgusting, and I'm done talking what? here. Any well, questions? Well, I, I fill up. Go ahead. Do you mind? I'm just I'm so so. You you were hoping maybe to put 57 units on that land. Is that what? Like I'm just trying to. I'm not sitting there, so it's hard for me to see your expression. I can't see anybody. Were you thinking that if you bought it, that's what you might do with it? No, I, I threw that out there because somebody wanted to know what I would think about doing. I had no proposed oh. time. Nothing. I just. Thought somebody wanted to hear some development on that land. Okay, all right. That's what I just. I, I mean, I could I put two hundred units on that land. Anybody could. But what's right. best for the people is what I was looking at. I just wanted to but be what, here. Yeah, to what's best that. for the people? Okay. No, thank you, Philip. I just wanted to be clear on that. Okay. okay. Thank you. And, and I had okay. to be clear on myself what I was saying here for what I did and started. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. Any questions for Mr. Cameron? We certainly thank you for certainly thank you for coming.
coming forward, uh, Mr. Cameron, and, and, and uh, sharing with us and expressing your views. So thank you very, very much. Okay, uh, I don't see any lights. Um, it's time for the question. Um, I'll read in to just again what the what the, re the recommendation is, and basically what this is is it's moving it to council, as the mayor said on the on the twenty first of uh, of the month uh, at six thirty. Uh, council will continue to. Uh, each individual counselor consider, as, as others have said, this is very, very difficult. We will consider to, you know, c take it into consideration, and each of us will vote that night in the democratic process, and and, and we'll see where it where it goes. So, uh, so the recommendation from planning board, it's been, uh, is the application initiated by the city of Summerside for a portion of PID number three two two three three nine to amend the city of Summerside zoning bylaw from Parkland P zone to high density residential R4 zone be recommended to be approved by council. That was moved by Councillor Adams and it was seconded by Mayor Stewart. So we all understand the question. If we vote for it, it goes ahead to uh, council with the endorsement of planning board. If we vote against it, it goes to uh, council without the endorsement of, of planning board. So. Just planning board voting, so. So either way, it's gotta go to it, council. For full council vote. will have the final say. Right. Okay, ready for the question? Go ahead. All those in favor say aye. Aye, to get it to council, yes. So we have Councillor Adams and the mayor voting aye, uh, nay. Nay. Vote. If, 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 it just, if it's just the rezoning, if it means we're taking the green um, space away, I'm going to vote against that. Thank not you. housing, nothing to do with housing. I'm voting against taking the green space away. Thank you. It's, well, the next one is, is a green space as well, yes. So, yeah, yeah. That's your rationale for voting against it, though, is that it's green space, if I understand. That's my, yeah. that's my well, that's yes. what the people are telling me, that yeah. they, they want to keep the green space. So, Understood. Yeah. So the vote is 2-1 in favor, so it will go forward on the 21st at 6.30 to council. So I think that it's important that that part is clear for the members of the audience, that it's going to full council for a full council discussion, if they want, or debate before the final vote. This is to get it moved through the process. Okay, we will move on with the next item on the agenda uh, for planning board, which is a uh, the recommendation on 395 Brophy Avenue Park and Green Space Map uh, Amendment. Uh, support explanation, the purpose. The purpose of the Park and Green Space Map Amendment is to delete the portion 2.78 acres of the Tower Street Mini Park uh, 140. Uh, background, an application was initiated by the City of Summerside for a portion of PID number 322339 to amend the city official plan and land use from parkland to residential and city zoning bylaw from parkland P zone to high density residential R4 zone. When an application is received, staff shall review the impact of the parks and green space plan 2012. A public meeting was held on February 23, 2022 and council gave first reading on the same date. Tower Street Park is made up of two parcels of land. One is vacant green space, uh, 2.78 acres. The other is uh, utilized as a playground, 0.75 acres. The playground area will remain as is and is scheduled to be improved this year. And there's a map showing the, uh, the portion to be deleted and the portion to be that would remain as, as parkland. A report under section 5.7 of the zoning bylaw when Planning Board reviews a zoning bylaw amendment. It has to consider the following general criteria as applicable. Under section 8.4 of the Parks and Green Space Plan, the criteria B, C, E, G, and H must be considered. Conformity with the official plan. Staff comment. The proposed amendment will require an amendment to the Parks and Green Space Plan. Uh, C, suitability of the site for the proposed development. Staff comment, Tower Street, 140, on the map is uh, is one of 13 mini parks in the city. 
as per section 5.6 conclusions of the uh, park and green space plan based on 2011 census data in, in 1983 National Parks and Recreation uh, Association, our supply of mini parks is over double the maximum range. Summerside has 13 mini parks, most of which are oriented to the needs of the nearby residential area. I'm not going to read those into the record. I think people can see them. Certainly Tower Street Park is there. Um, and people are familiar, I think, with most of them. Uh, mini parks oversupply. The total area of mini parks in the city is more than double. That, that is required under the maximum uh, National Parks and Recreation Association standards. Our supply of mini parks even exceeds the needs of typically young families in newer suburban areas. This oversupply probably reflects the relative ease of acquiring parks through subdivision parkland dedication process, which avoids imposing land acquisition costs to the city. However, this oversupply does place additional costs on the city in the form of capital improvements and ongoing maintenance. Small size, the average size of mini parks is only 1.19 acres and has some, uh, and, and some are too small to be useful. This probably reflects the fact that residential subdivisions in Summerside have often been developed in small phases because of limited growth demand. Any comments from residents and other persons uh, staff comment. A public meeting was held on uh, February 23rd, 2022. The public meeting notice was advertised in the February 8th edition of The Guardian. 32 letters were mailed to uh, 26 property owners. Rob Philpott, City of Summerside, provided an overview of the development and noted that the housing is needed in the community and a portion of the lands, uh, the subject property, is vacant green space that is not currently being utilized. Written comments were received from 38 of the tenants, uh, 376 Duke Street, 388 Brophy Avenue, and 391 Brophy Avenue, and are attached to this report. Written comments were also received from 34 tenants, 390 Brophy, and are attached to this report. Uh, the written comments uh, were opposed to selling the land and rezoning the land, Terry Lynn Gallant, 382 Brophy Avenue, submitted written con comments. Her concerns were low-income housing and increased traffic. Bob McLeod, tenant 390 Brophy Avenue, is not proposed to development, but does not want to see the park plan rezoned. Kathy and Bill McGinnis, owners 390 Brophy Avenue, Chesapeake Apartment, expressed concerns regarding the lack of notification in relation to the potential sale of the city land, traffic concerns for their tenants, and they oppose the rezoning of park land. Anna Johnson, tenant 390 Brophy Avenue, raised concerns about the increase of traffic on Brophy Avenue and the noise that will be created during uh, construction phase. Philip Cameron, owner 390 Brophy Avenue and 445 Tower Street, expressed concerns about losing this parkland and the traffic implications on his property and tenants as a result of this development. Community Services reviewed the development proposal and uh, its impact on parks and green space in the area. The remaining portion of Tower Street Park will remain the primary green space in the area and will be serviced and will service the development of the existing neighborhood as well. Proposed land are unused green spaces and the development will be proposed minimal if any impact on parks and green space in the area. G, impact of development on pedestrian vehicle access and safety and on public safety generally. Staff comment, the proposed deletion of the portion of Tower Street Park has no impact on pedestrian vehicle access and safety or on the public safety generally. H, compatibility of development with the environmental, scenic, and heritage resources. Staff comment, there are no compatibility issues regarding environmental, scenic, or heritage resources. Staff review, uh, city staff supports the application issued by the city to delete a portion of Tower Street Park 140. As per section 5.10, subsection B3, the zoning by the planning board shall make recommendation to council on this application before it is approved or denied. The planning board recommendation, whether carried or defeated, will be brought forward to council for a final vote. So the planning board recommendation, the application initiated, um, where am I here? the application initiated by the city to amend the parks and green space plan map, deleting a portion of Tower Street Park 140, 2.7 acres, to, to be recommended to be approved by council. And if I could have a mover and a seconder for that. Moved by Councillor Adams. Second, we have a seconder by Mayor Stewart. Just to move it on to Council as well. Just move it on to Council as well. And I would, 
again, there's a whole bunch of other letters that aren't mentioned in the staff comments I've received that we've already read into the record in the previous agenda item, so I don't think there's any need to read them in again. Just a question in regards to it, maybe you mentioned it there, in the proposed area to be uh, for the park, is that, will that be subdivided out of the parcel? In the sub it's already. It's a separate, separate lot presently? Yeah. I think, uh, Aaron, Linda, yes. Yes, whenever we asked the surveyor for the parcel for the go on the listing, the, I think it's 0.78 or three quarters of an acre, the existing area that has playground structures on it was a separate parcel. Okay, and uh, another thing too, if it's rezoned, and I got no idea what's gonna happen here, but I'm wondering, uh, would, will it be fenced? Or is, or how will it be obvious that it's uh, separated from the development? Well, Aaron, you want to answer that? Sure. Uh, You're supposed to be asking about the park itself or the development? Yes. Park itself is it going to be separated and obvious for the people that if it's rezoned, will it be obvious that it's a park? I know there's equipment in it, but it, will it be marked off or fenced in any way? Uh, that if it's the, it may come up at the time of development between the developer and the I'll say the parks department or what what they feel is needed as far as from, uh, our, what we call our parks and recreation uh, department. Community well, services. Community yeah. services. We'll yeah. get recommendations from them whether they feel it needs to be fenced off or if they have plans to fence it off further. Thank you. Okay, so that is the recommendation that's in front of us. I don't see any lights on. Your Worship, your lights on? No, I guess, oh, I guess okay. mine's on most of the time. They uh, okay, Barb, you have any other comments before we go to the vote here? Uh, n no, I'm ready to go to the vote. Okay, so I'll read the recommendation again. The application initiated by the City of Summerside to amend the parks and green space plan map deleting a portion of Fowler Street Park 140 2.78 acres to be recommended to be approved by council and that was moved by Councillor Adams and seconded by Mayor Stewart <laughs> planning board all those in favor say aye aye I get it moved forward yes and uh, against nay um, I, I guess I can't amend this because that means it's going to, to take away that green space. So I, I have to say nay. Again, it's nothing to do with affordable housing or housing period, but I have to say nay to getting rid of the green space. Okay, thank you, Councillor. Uh, so the motion has passed uh, two to one. So we'll go to Council on the 21st at 6.30. And we'll make sure we get this for first on the agenda on the, the council meeting and I, I'll be like Barb I, I won't be here that night but I will try to join so okay uh, that your worship I think I don't think there's anything else on the planning board agenda I think uh, we're going to talk about street naming policy but uh, we may as well cover that under tech services so we're going to the special right. council meeting now we are moving into special council meeting, Your Worship. The plan, I uh, should call for a motion to adjourn planning board. Moved by Councillor Adams, second by Your Worship. So uh, all those in favor say aye. Aye. We are adjourned. Aye. Thank you, folks. We are adjourned, and thank you, folks. And as I said, uh, we will uh, reconvene on the 21st, and council will give us every consideration in between. And contrary to what people might think, I don't think minds are made up. So. You're welcome to stay for the next portion. It's in regards to a couple other requests for development in uh, on Greenwood Drive and uh, Starlight area. So. So. so if, uh, Do you want to?
Are we still on there, Brian? Okay, we'll be, uh, we'll just have to wait a few minutes here. We've got some, uh, some uh, discussions here, and then we'll get back on the schedule here in a few seconds. Can we, uh, okay, we'll continue on uh, with uh, the meeting. Uh, just another half a minute, I believe the Deputy Mayor stepped out for a minute or a second. We'll just get going here. There's some, we've got a few other resolutions to move. Okay, we'll uh, call the meeting back to order, call the special council meeting to order. Is there a motion to approve the agenda? Moved by Councillor Snow and seconded by Councillor Drawn. All in favor? Country nay, carried. Okay, the first resolution. I'll turn it over to Councillor McFeely. You can stay seated if you want to, but it's up, if okay. you feel comfortable with. Thank you. Well, I like to do resolution standing up. Okay. <laughs> A little more formal than uh, 
Anyway, it's resolution COS 22-012, moved by myself, Councillor McFeely, seconded by Councillor Curry Adams, whereas an application was received from Campco Inc. to amend the future land use plan for a portion of PID number 69781 from industrial land use to residential land use under the City of Summerside official plan. And whereas in accordance with section 5.7 of the zoning bylaw, council shall consider the following general criteria as applicable. Conformity with all the requirements of this bylaw, conformity with the official plan, suitability of the site for the proposed development, compatibility of the proposed development with surrounding land uses, including both existing and projected uses, any comments from residents or other interested persons, Adequacy of existing water, sewer, road, storm water, and electrical service, city parking, and parkland for accommodating the development and any projected infrastructure requirements. Impact from the development on pedestrian vehicle access and safety and on public safety generally. Compatibility of the development with environmental, scenic, and heritage resources. Impacts on the city finances and budget. Other matters as specified in this bylaw. Other matters as considered relevant. Be it resolved that official plan Amendment 001, amendment uh, to amend the City of Summerside official plan be formally adopted. And this does not bear the recommendation of planning board meeting on February 23rd. And I'll read the amendment into the record, the official plan amendment 001. Uh, the Council of the City of Summerside under the authority vested in it by Section 18 of the Planning Act, RSPEI 1988 Cap P-8, Hereby enacts as follows. One, the land use for portion PID number 69781, as shown on Schedule B of the future land use plan, is designated as residential land use, hereby excluding it from its former designation in industri of industrial land use under City of Summerside official plan. And two, the land use of portion of PID number 69781, shown on Schedule B of the City of Summerside zoning bylaw, is designated as residential land use, hereby uh, excluding it from its former designation of industrial land use. So it's moved by Councillor McFeely and seconded by Councillor Adams. Is Councillor Ramsey is still in the air? No, I don't, okay. Yes, I'm here. Okay. <laughs> okay, I just wanted it for the record here. Moved by Councillor McFeely and seconded. I was on mute, I was on mute. Okay. And uh, second by Councillor Adams. You've all heard the resolution. All in favor say aye. Country nay? Nay. Motion defeated unanimously. Defeated, yeah. So, Sorry? What is it? So you don't have to do a second reading or the formal adoption. It's defeated. So, so resolutions 22013 and 14. 014 are irrelevant. Okay, we'll continue on with the next one. I okay, believe is 015. To uh, resolution uh, COS 22 015. Moved by myself, Councillor McFeely, seconded by Councillor Kerry Adams. Whereas an application was received from McDuff Property Development for a zoning amendment for PID number 615286. Agricultural A zone to low density mixed residential R2 zone under the City of Summerside zoning bylaw. <coughs> and whereas zoning bylaw amendment 004, a bylaw to amend the City of Summerside zoning bylaw was read and declared as read the first time at the council meeting held on February 16, 2022. And whereas, in accordance with section 5.7 of the zoning bylaw, council shall consider the following general criteria as applicable conformity with all requirements of this bylaw conformity with the official plan, suitability of the site for the proposed development, compatibility of the proposed development with surrounding land uses, including both existing and projected uses, any comments from residents or other interested persons, adequacy of existing water, sewer, road, storm water, and electrical service, city parking and parklands for accommodating the development and any projected infrastructure requirements, impacts from the development on pedestrian vehicle access and safety and on public safety generally, Compatibility of development with environmental, scenic, and heritage resources. Impacts on the city finances and budget. Other matters as specified by this bylaw. Other matters as considered relevant. Be it resolved that zoning amendment 004 bylaw to amend the uh, city of Summerside zoning bylaw be hereby declared as read a second time. 
and this bears the recommendation of planning board meeting held February 23rd, 2022. And uh, Schedule B, the zoning bylaw amendment 004, a bylaw to amend the uh, City of Summerside zoning bylaw. The Council of the City of Summerside under authority vested in it by Section 18 and 19 of the Planning Act, RSBEI 1988 CAP P-8. Hereby enacts as follows, the zoning for PID number 615286, shown on Schedule B of the zoning of the City of Summerside zoning bylaw is designated as low density mixed residential R2 zone, hereby excluding it from its former designation of agricultural A zone and the map shown the subject property north of the Confederation Trail is attached to your worship. So moved by Councillor McFeely and seconded by Councillor Adams. Any questions? All in favor say aye. 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 Contrary nay. Gary, can I just ask the question, sorry to Councillor McFeely, but regarding the last one, uh, I know there were, it, it ended up fairly quickly, but I'm wondering, do we need any more explanation for members of the public watching it or the people who had it in, you know, where it uh, goes from here? I know we've got, it was voted down. The one that was or, voted down? Yeah. I just yeah, I think the, um, uh, I, I guess my, interpretation of the uh, of the sentiment of planning board was that that there's a real concern about turning industrial land into residential land and that we need to protect the uh, the industrial land in the area that's generally all along Greenwood Drive is an industrial area and uh, that, that there was uh, a sense that that should be maintained so that's my interpretation. Yeah, I know right. others have thoughts yeah. as well. I'm just wondering, with, somebody will get back to the, to well, the proposal, I, proposer, right? To yes, sure. I, I've been uh, talking with the developer and uh, I'm setting a meeting up with uh, our economic development officer and uh, them to go over some options for their development. So, thank and you. Think, and, and for me, it was based on the uh, report and information that we received through economic development about there has been a need for some of that industrial land and more, more of it's getting used up for other uses. So somebody will contact the developer. Uh, uh, just speak for myself here, I, I do think there is a, a possible solution with that land. I know Councilor McDougall had mentioned it previously with uh, some sort of split use of the land, so hopefully we can have some discussions. Uh, to my comment earlier tonight, the last thing we want to do is turn away developers when they're coming looking to develop in your city. So I think we need to make sure we're proactive in making every attempt to keep them here and find a way to make it, it work for everybody. Thank you. Floor is yours, Councilor McPhee. Moving on to the next resolution. Resolution COS 22-016, moved by myself, Councilor McPhee, seconded by Councilor Adams. Uh, whereas an application was received from McDuff Property Development for a zoning amendment for a portion of PID number 615286 from Agricultural A Zone to Low Density Mixed Residential R2 Zone under the City of Summerside Zoning Bylaw. And whereas Zoning Bylaw Amendment 004, a bylaw to amend the City of Summerside Zoning Bylaw, was read and declared as read at two separate meetings of council held on different days. Be it resolved that zoning uh, bylaw Amendment 004, a bylaw to amend the City of Summerside zoning by bylaw be hereby formally adopted. Moved by Councillor McFeely and seconded. Was it Councillor Adams? Councillor Adams. Any questions on the resolution? All in favor say aye. Aye. Contrary nay. Carried. And moving on, Your Worship, two more here. Uh, COS 22-017. Moved by myself, Councillor McFeely, seconded by Councillor Adams, whereas an application was received from McDuff Property Development for a zoning amendment uh, for PID number 615278, the Manger Culture A zone, the high density residential R4 zone under the City of Summerside zoning bylaw. And whereas zoning bylaw amendment 007, the bylaw to amend the City of Summerside zoning bylaw was read and declared as read the first time at the council meeting on February 20, uh, excuse me, 16th, 2022. And whereas in accordance with section 7.5 of the zoning bylaw, council shall consider the following general criteria as applicable. Conformity with all the requirements of this bylaw, conformity with the official plan, suitability of the site for the proposed development, compatibility of the proposed development uh, 
with surrounding land uses, including both existing and projected uses. Any comments from residents or other interested persons? Adequacy of the existing water, sewer, road, storm water, and electrical service, city parking, and parkland for accommodating the development and any projected infrastructure requirements. Impacts from the development on pedestrian vehicular access and safety and on public safety generally. Compatibility of development with environmental, scenic, and heritage resources. Impact on the city's finances and budgets. Other matters as specified in this bylaw. Other matters as considered relevant. Be resolved as only amendment 007, the bylaw to amend the city of Summerside zoning bylaw be hereby declared as read a second time. And this bears the recommendation of planning board meeting <coughs> held on February 23rd, 2022. And I'll read the zoning amendment 007, the bylaw to amend the city of Summerside zoning bylaw into the record. The council of the city of Summerside under authority vested in it by section 18, section 19 of the planning act RSPEI 1988 Cap P-8, hereby enacts as follows. The zoning for PID number 615278, shown on Schedule B of the City of Summerside Zoning Bylaw, is designated as High Density Residential R4 Zone, hereby excluding it from its former designation Agricultural A Zone, and the map shows the subject property south of the trail. There you worship. Moved by Councillor McFeely and seconded by Councillor Adams. Any questions on the resolution? Councillor Adams, you're late telling me. I'll just make a comment after okay. the vote. Okay. All in favor say aye. Aye. Country nay. Aye. Carried. Go ahead, Councillor um, Adams. I just wanted to um, pass on, this is my ward, so I just sort of wanted to speak to those that had reached out. Um, there were only a few not even a handful that reached out. I think people in the area see the need for the housing. I think that um, the developers in the area have proven themselves. Um, you know, it's anything when you come into a new area to develop, there's relationships that have to be built with the neighbors. But um, I think we're, we're working through that and I think um, the residents appreciate that. Um, I do, Myself, I travel Water Street East multiple times a day, sometimes too many times a day, um, and there is an issue with traffic. We do, um, as a council, we recognize that, and it's not that you have to live in the area. I think everybody here is on board that, um, that the east-west connector is a need at this point and not a nice to have, the same as, um, when we did the roundabout and so on. It's, it's something that it's time. Um, and we've been working on this and we have requested that there be money in this year's coming budget. So I'm hopeful that that will work its way in there and hopefully we can begin on the road to um, the east-west connector and getting more homes in our city and therefore more business and, and building for generations to come and that's what that's what it's about and we have to you know it's we're here now but we have to remember what we're leaving for those those ahead of us so that's it thank you councillor adams um for your comments uh we had the vote you got one more i should say one more thing sure i do and it's coming up later i do appreciate and other people have mentioned it in the area mcduff's have taken from the street name list um in that area it was uh, Logie, Ellis, and Starlight. So it was nice, people commented that it was from the street naming list, but it actually pertained to the area. So the, I know the Ellis family is from that area. That, yeah, so that was, that was nice to see. So thank you for that. Thank you. Go ahead, uh, Councilor Final McCreary. resolution, Your Worship. COS 22-018, moved by myself, Councillor McFeely, seconded by Councillor Kerry Adams. Whereas an application was received from McDuff Property Development for a zoning amendment uh, for PID number 615278 from Agriculture A Zone, the high density residential R4 zone under the City of Summerside zoning bylaw. And whereas zoning bylaw amendment 007, the bylaw to amend the City of Summerside zoning bylaw was read and declared as read at two separate meetings of council held on different days. Be resolved that zoning bylaw amendment 007, the bylaw to amend the city of Summerside zoning bylaw, be hereby formally adopted. 
Moved by Councillor McFeely and seconded by Councillor Adams. Any questions? All in favor say aye. 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 Contrary nay. Carried. Aye. Thank you. So that's the last one we have for the special council meeting, but I believe we've got a committee meeting now. Okay, is there a motion to adjourn the council meeting and then we'll get back into the text. Moved by Councillor McDougall and seconded by Councillor Campbell. Meeting adjourned. Okay, uh, we will, uh, all in favor, I should say. Country and carry. Okay, we'll call the technical services. Right, turn it over to the chair. All right, thank Councillor you. Councillor Duran, the floor is yours, sir. You. Thank you, Your Worship. We'll give uh, Councillor McFeely a short break. Uh, <laughs> a couple items on tech services this evening. First one uh, is with respect to traffic calming. Um, the topic has been brought up a few times in the last couple of years by this council and uh, tech services throughout the years have implemented uh, some different trials and, uh, and methods and they said that they were gonna come back to us with some initial info and uh, so Aaron's here tonight uh, with that. Tech services did some work. Um, he's got a presentation. There will be, I believe, some options for Council to consider in general citywide and uh, some of these discussions might spark some smaller ones uh, in terms of uh, how we might want to proceed with some specific areas. So I will turn it over to Director Aaron and uh, we'll take a look at the presentation. Okay, th thanks, uh, Councillor Drop. Uh, as he mentioned, uh, we've been dealing with uh, off and on some traffic calming options and I'm just going to present to you a few slides. We had some time now since uh, last year's construction season ended and we're in the middle of doing designs for the upcoming year to try and focus a little bit of attention on some, I'll say some uh, other other items that have a different time frame or no set time frame, but that we're trying to get them back before you for consideration. So again, we're looking at some traffic calming and typically traffic calming methods are usually only considered on local streets. So again, as he mentioned, we have tried to use, or you guys have had at your disposal, uh, a number of tools for traffic calming that we've used to date. Uh, we're fortunate to have our own uh, police force that we have some great working uh, relationship with. Uh, we collect data throughout the city for the last 20 years as part of that data. For volume, we also get the speeds. Uh, we pass that information on to the police within a couple of days of getting the data uh, wi without them even requesting locations. Uh, we also then have a, if they get some sections where they're either wanting some additional data to target some areas or if there's complaints or issues come in, we can also select those for additional counts as well and as well as the speed. So that's our enforcement section as well. Uh, again, the dynamic speed sign consists of our dolly that we have as well as some permanent ones that have been rolled out in the, in the entrances or prominent uh, busier streets in the, in the city. We have used stop signs prior to numerous instances as well, as well as some speed bumps or humps and there's kind of the small ones that we put down and I'll call say the hump, the larger ones that we've done with asphalt. So again, you, <laughs> We've had debates back and forth about those are some of the tools tools that we have to use. And uh, there's been a request to try and research some other methods that we could use. Are we trying to say, trying to give you guys some other tools for the toolkit? Uh, again, uh, the stop signs, typically when we're coming out, speeding has been brought forward as an issue. It's usually trying to deal with the excessive speeding. So again, we tried to, uh, we had some instances where we've placed some stop signs in to try and reduce the excess of uh, speeding. And it does appear to reduce them and the general feeling is there. But when we actually do follow up data afterwards in a couple of months, in a couple of ones that we've done, it actually showed a slight increase. So instead of, uh, of it actually, it kind of gave a reverse order for us. So it, it also brought a port again in one location we had where we put it in, even though we put up the new signs and say it's new, then we got complaints that people were rolling the stop signs, so that it, it, it brought in an additional uh, issue for us to deal with. It does give the feeling of fixing the problem, but in fact, it can make it worse. We actually had, in one location we had, we had conversations with three different people, households, after the fact, a few months after, and what they thought about it. And it was after we had the data, and we said, you know, do you, how do you think it's working? Do you think it's slowing down? What are you noticing? All three said, yes, it's been 
good and it's been decreased the number of speeders and we actually showed them the data then that actually there was an increase which surprised them but it's just so we just try and deal with it and say that's probably not working we need to come up with something else the intent is there we and even the people think it is but we're actually getting more than we so that's not really what we what desirable for us to do either but so we're trying to come up with some other options that's again something, that's something like the one you done for me down on craig we thought it were people rushing to the McDonald's restaurant. It, yeah, the, and the, the complaint. that they were rushing and leaving, and they're not yeah. going. Well, the, it was targeted. We felt that the, us with the complaint committee in that instance, it was all predominantly thought to just be a noon time, time. And when we actually did the counts, it wasn't. It was more than we would have thought, and it wasn't just at noon time. It was spread out throughout the day. That it wasn't just a. The good news is it wasn't just a noon time thing that we could address. The fortunate part it was spread out throughout the day once we had the data that we could pass on them. That was our personal opinion. It's also been stated in other national uh, standards as far as using stop signs. We did do some search and other jurisdictions create a whole traffic common uh, procedures and manuals and stuff. This was an excerpt out of one of the ones in, uh, in Ontario that we have copies of. We did some in Dieppe as well just to search different areas and stop signs should not be used for speed control unwarranted stop signs increase vehicular speeds between stop signs and encourage rolling stops which was exactly what what we had found so again it pressed us to say look we got to try and spend some time here and come up with some more options for you to consider so again people typically drive as comfortable as they feel they can handle the surroundings you know if the right if the road is wider there's not many driveways that many streets the speed just tend to elevate regardless of what's posted some methods are using to try to Again, I'll run through some, some here, and I'm not suggesting which ones until the end. I just want to give you some, basically, you, you narrow up one section or you choke it. The dimension on here is 4.3 meters. You're basically forcing people to say, look, it's only going to be one way at this spot. You're going to, we'd have to put signage up on both sides saying you're going to have to yield oncoming traffic. Uh, one lane would be wide enough to handle oversized vehicles, but would not fit through, fit two. We would make what's in blue there, these temporary temporary measures to see if it actually would work. We wouldn't suggest going and curbing this and putting it in permanent. We would make a trial for the summer and saying, let's put it in, let's collect data. What goes in there, I got a couple options to show you, but these blue things in the upper corner, there's concrete, they're high enough, there's signage on it. We have to put some reflectors on it so they're visibility at nighttime. We'd also have to put some signage on the approach to say traffic calming or road narrowing ahead just so people are aware. Again, we, the general talk of that one was narrow it, mid-block, the area that we're having a problem. When people actually feel it narrowed up, they actually slow down. But again, so that's one option to consider. That, that was considered as a making a one-way. This option here is to do the same thing, but narrow it up. Our streets are wider than two lanes. In a lot of spots, we're having troubles, but they have a paved shoulder for parking or a pull-off. So we're saying in a couple of locations, actually narrow the actual street up just to two narrow lanes. For, for reference, you'd still have two-way traffic through here. That's six meters. I'm not sure where you guys all parked today, but a parking stall at City Hall is three meters. So it still fits, two cars can meet. If you happen to be meeting, they would be going slowing down. It's, well, I open my doors. I open my doors when I park down here, but I don't hit any other cars. But they say it's, it's you're, a typical country road is asphalt width is six meters. But you have a comfort of having a paved shoulder. So the intent is to try to create some measures here to basically say, look, that's restricted, I'm gonna slow down. In the upper left corner was the first, I showed you one that was a lot lower. This is the other option to go with something that's higher. Again, the intent is not for these to be permanent, is to actually put a measure in place, try it to see if you're actually getting results. And I'll get into that when we get a little bit Again, you don't put these at close to driveway locations, so you have to pick your spot and try not to restrict visibility with too much stuff there. Again, signage, everything would have to go along with it. So, Aaron, can yeah. have, so um, there's no sidewalks in a lot of the areas where yes. these would be, so what would be the... We, again, we just did the graphic. We would have to yeah. pull it out a little bit to allow people to still walk in along the, the curb line. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Yeah. So that people to allow to... Right. We just want... It's, if we got 
blew it up real tight for the yeah. detail, we'd miss the width of the street. It's probably yeah. in front of two or three okay. houses. So, so the pedestrians yeah. would be able to walk, walk between, in behind right. it. Right, yeah. because... Not to bring them out choking into where the two lanes are. Yeah, because yeah. in addition to not having sidewalks, then we also have ditches, so we have yeah. to... Yeah, exactly, yeah. And again, in situations where I just wanted to make aware of, a lot of times it's not just... If we have a long stretch where we're having this being, one location is probably not going to fix it. You know, they're going to slow down at that one location, so you may have to have a series of a couple of these on a long stretch of a street. Again, the intent would be uh, if we purchase these barriers, they'd be reusable, not just for one location. Over the course of a few years when we get locations, we'd either have them that they can be lifted with a boom truck or a forklift, move them to various locations so that it's not a you're basically saying, I want to try this in various locations this year, and next year they go in different locations. And again, they must go with signage to go with them, be reflective so that people aren't going to run into them. And they can't carry them yeah, they're not physically easily going to be moved. Either. It's a fair point, though, that people aren't easily going to adjust it in and then have it get moved. You're basically using a, a, a backhoe or a, or a forklift to, uh, to move them. Aaron, wouldn't the theory of the stop sign and cars speeding up after stopping also wouldn't wouldn't this sort of be the exact same thing cars would just slow down if we're saying they're doing it for a stop sign what would stop them from doing the exact same thing here if you're speeding to try to get to wherever you're going you're probably going to speed after you if that's what we're saying right and i agree and that's why yeah. one of the other things is to actually to provide one step is going to be go out do the counts and speeds beforehand put the temporary measure in place a month or two later when everybody's used to it maybe get their speeds back up to or their comfort going through it the first time and verify it again and come back to us to say this is either working if it's if it is working do we then try to make this i got another slide so do you make it more permanent or if it's not working are we going to try something else yeah and uh so again these were just uh, again with either with a high barrier making it one way or do you make a two-way again? Again, the type of barrier we can design later to say go with, prefer to go with the low ones with signage or go with the higher ones. There's also options for narrowing things up if, the, if it tends to be just an issue at the intersection. If they're either flying through an intersection or excessive speeds. The intersections, again, is the same method. Make it narrower so that people actually see something tighter space that they're coming upon. Also, the actual width still allows them to have two-lane traffic. And again, in this instance, we would probably recommend you go with the low version versus the high vision version to make sure you keep your visibility of intersections, whether it be anybody walking, pets, anything that happened to be on the street or anything going, they wouldn't obstruct the view if you happen to be coming in one direction. These were three and four feet high. You may not see around it. The challenge with doing these in the intersection if you just picture this is, I listed either a bus, a garbage truck, regular deliveries, or salt truck, or any kind of a oil truck. If you're coming here and you're going to make this turn, these are called turn radius, and that's really why they're wider. So doing it at an intersection, although it does happen, you do run into restrictions there that's going to be forcing that vehicle into the oncoming lane whenever they turn around. You'll notice some of the bigger stuff almost drives over the curb and the existing intersections we have. So it's not perfect. There's pluses and minus to all of them. Sorry? That's what I'm saying. The first one I have is bosses. And that's the, if, if they're turning, it's great if they're going straight through, but if they're turning right there, you're going to have trouble on the corners there. So we're saying it's not a, there's trade offs with uh, some of these options. If it turned out in this example or any other example to say, we did it, we tried it, we're happy with it, uh, and when I say we're happy with, after these get installed, Maybe the neighbors aren't happy with it either. Like, you know, like you're maybe going to get feedback through that trial session and say, are we going to do it? If it was at an intersection, you would basically use the same alignment, adjust your curbs, or else create some sidewalk pad areas that they could still potentially, if it was a large vehicle, drive over it. And you would actually make it permanent and budget to do that a following year in any one of the options. If you got your results back that you're comfortable with and that you had enough time to get feedback from the, the abutting uh, residents and neighbors because typically we look at our percentages and we do these counts the extreme one we get 10 or 15 percent of people that are my own personal excessive speed and that i consider it's not is more than 20 over if i'm going more than 20 over it's an automatic ticket you shouldn't be able to say anything you know it's 
everybody's always going a certain percentage, not everybody, there's a certain percentage that's going a little bit over. The ones that we're always trying to target are the ones that are excessively over. So in a lot of locations, a high, high percentage are not, and we're gonna put these measures in. And the other 90% of the people that aren't causing the excessive speeding are probably gonna be somewhat annoyed that I'm going through here and you're hitting my mirrors or, so it's not all gonna be. We wanna make sure if you do a trial, that if you have time then before you spend the money and do it permanent, that you get the feedback. Another, I'll say more extreme measure, or, or sometimes that's done, they actually realign the intersections slightly so that they're not just straight throughs. Again, we're not recommending all these options. We wanna show you there is different things and then pick from there. What you're doing is you're basically forcing traffic when they come up before, instead of them seeing all the way straight through, they realize ahead there is some maneuvers to make. There are some obstructions that they're gonna to have to maneuver around. Again, these could be either low or high. Uh, typically at the intersection, we're saying we would like them to be low not to cause any visibility instructions, obstructions. This method does allow for two-way traffic to maintain. I do feel there will be some, if I'm heading, let's say to the right or to, if I'm coming in this path here and I have to then jog out here, when you go across this intersection, there's gonna be a little bit of wandering here. That's gonna be a challenge for certainly some people to maneuver in the middle of the intersection. And it's gonna be, create another challenge for us, but it'll definitely slow people down as far as going straight through that intersection. So again, they're another thing to, as far as uh, realign them. Again, we need to come up with a, an implement, implementation method or some steps. Uh, we look at some of these different options. Uh, we've, we, if we get a location that we're trying to consider, we either select the location that's gonna meet some criteria, choose the exact location on that street, and what type of method we're gonna try and use. We suggest that we wanna have, we always wanna try and give you some, some analysis before and after, so and especially afterwards. But if we went ahead before time and said, we think there's a lot of speed in there. We'll come back to you and say, here's the actual numbers we're noticing in two days, and here's the numbers, do you want us to still proceed? Then if we decide to proceed, we want to collect the, the, the data ahead of time, the volume as well as the speeds, because maybe the volume's gonna drop as well. If people are just gonna avoid it and start going another way, we're gonna create the problem on another street, but at least we'll know that the volumes have dropped and we're not gonna a lot of speeders, they've just gone somewhere else, you know? All the installations have to go down with signage, to make sure it's not just putting the things in place. Again, as I mentioned, we want to collect data, the same data we did before we went. We want to go back a month or two afterwards so that people get back to their comfort level. We would remove those temporary measures seasonally so they're not interfering with any salt or snow or drifts or anything else. Typically, by we, when we get to that seasonal, or we don't tend to get as many speed complaints. Uh, snow and winter conditions hopefully account for that. There is still some people that do still whip around and. Maybe that's because we clean off the streets so well and everything that everybody feels a high level of comfort at their speed, so. <laughs> but I, we're gonna, again, I tried not, I picked a couple of locations that we've been talking about, but the same principle applies citywide where, if we pick a spot. So again, after we got the data, we would like to review the results and then decide then with this, okay, is that warranted actually? Did we get a big drop or not? And is it warranted then doing a more permanent uh, installation? Again, another example you might have heard people talk about again is a more extreme, but if they're having a lot of cut throughs in a neighborhood, not just typically a neighborhood, they're trying to decrease people from going that way. In this instance, they're basically forcing people they call out a chicane to wander through with their vehicles to really slow them down. And that stopped people that are cutting through from one area of town to another, if we have that type of instance. It also could be used in a uh, local spot as well. They, this is not like textbook stuff. This is stuff that's in, we've gone to numerous spots to check this stuff out and this exists. This picture is itself is not from Halifax, but I've driven through them in Halifax. I've also gone through some of the ones as far as that we used ourselves with the, not the bumps, but the humps. I have videos of it. I wouldn't want to put it up on the screen and make you seasick trying to watch it. I could not keep up to the car ahead of me going through those humps. As soon as we went over one, they were gone and I just nailed and I couldn't catch them, they, they, they signed me to their marketing it because they had, again, they put maybe four or five up on a long stretch of a subdivision. So again, I'm, I'm not sold on that one in a subdivision. They will slow down people in the 10 or 20 meters before in the direction of the hump. People slow down, but then after that, they're gunning back up to their speed. So 
That's a one-way street, that one, last one. The, yeah, I, I just because I had a picture of the one-way, but still, yes. So again, uh, our own uh, thoughts are of the options that we looked at tonight. I feel comfortable or more comfortable, I guess, as you mentioned, there's challenges with each one of them. They're going to cause some other stuff that we need to, we need to be aware of. If we're going to try one, we try something that's in the middle of a block, not necessarily the intersection ones. There was too many trade-offs or more trade-offs on the, on the intersection ones. Only do them where we're actually going to have a percentage now of data going more than 20 over because that's, we're trying to target our excessive speeders. Another number that's used out there is, this is our counter that we use. And this is what we lay down, we have four of them, we put them down, it's, it gives us every car that's gone over at what time and how fast. It spins out this formula in this sheet that we pass off. It gives us automatically what's considered the 85% of In other words, here's where 85% of the people are this and lower. So again, we're trying to target that top end group. And they'll also tell us what that speed is. If the 85% of the people are not going more than 10 or 15 kilometers over, it probably shouldn't be considered either. So again, those are a couple of scenarios we'd say, pick a street and we go and test it and come back. We should go back to saying a couple of criteria. Let's live with a couple of criteria and if they don't meet that, let's not go and spend it as a, spend the effort of, of uh, putting up the temporary measures for a year. I'm not as comfortable as making our drivers go down to the one way, both way. Uh, I personally just see too many bad or erroneous movements happening while I'm driving around, I'll say. that I don't have a comfort level of suggested at the start that we make it down to one lane. Too many bad drivers, just flat out, there's too many bad drivers that are making mistakes, so. And I suggest that we only implement a permanent situation if we see it a significant drop from before the install to after the, in other words, it's gonna cost us money to do these permanently and if we're not going to get the results, there's no sense of, of doing that. I see you talking, sorry, talking speed bumps along any place here? Oh, we have that measure that we're using now. We're trying to give you something else to say that yeah. we did them, we had them, for example, down in Willow. Yeah. We put them down. The, it was a combination of the people as well as the horsemen. They're trying to go. Within four months, people were going that speed before or more. They slowed down there and they were, we did that oh, one. You, so You had mentioned something permanently. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're saying if we try one of these other methods, and it, it may well be, I mean, we could go back and look, is Elm Street successful directly just in front of the school with the asphalt ones? You know, again, it's debate. But if you found that was permanent, you're only trying to slow people down that short distance in front of the actual school, it may be viable to, that, that would be a permanent fix there instead of the so large rubber ones. It worked out of green, uh, Greenfield, the, the speed hump on, on Derby. Not another question since we put that in. Yeah. Councillor Rams, you still with us? No. No. Okay, no. Uh, I didn't want to know you had mentioned Elm that's, Street. That was, that's, that was the end of what I was wanting them open. Any questions? Yeah. I just wanted it's, to present stuff to you. Yeah. Yeah. Aaron, the, yeah. uh, the only question I had is when, uh, and it was just when I was looking at where you headed on Crozier and Heron, I think that's where Councillor Adams was talking about the four-way stop. Yeah. Is that it? Yep. Right there? So I guess, I'm just thinking, wouldn't it be easier to put in four stop signs there and do the and do the the numbers? Yeah. And I didn't want to get into the details of every. I want to just look. No, we can get into individual locations and yeah. come back to you and say, here's the data. Yeah. But we were back and we did find some data from 2018. I have it here, but I don't want to get into specifics. Okay, no, there wasn't. That's fair. There wasn't a. Uh, I can share them with you afterwards. You want? There wasn't the high speeders. I want to make sure we're targeting the measure to deal with if there's people that are actually not stopping at the thing or let's deal with the rolling stops or not stopping for the buses or mm -hmm. or if it's mean into the ways of say we have a high volume of people trying to get to and from a park and you need a sidewalk deal with it through those as far as but I don't want to put something in there and think that it's working and it's not going to be getting your overall end result but I still want you just to look at overall other methods that we wanted to consider and if you just don't want to do any of them that's our job was to come back to you with uh, something more than a stop sign or something more than a bump that that That's other fair. people were doing or, or not. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Like my, and I'll just talk about this. Um, the reason that it was brought to me is because there's a bus, the bus stops there and it picks up some children. So that's why, um, you know, and it's law enforcement people that live in the area that have brought this to me multiple times as well as other families um, 
that just in that area say there's 17 kids so when those 17 kids are walking like I know now you said that they'll go into the inside of a barrier if that's the way it went but I guess people just looked at it it was easier for just there to be a stop sign and then the kids knew the drivers knew the bus drivers knew it was it wasn't causing any more confusion I would love to try something like this like on a newer road not a road that is well established you know what I mean that if it goes in new and we're having trouble right away try something like it but th that's just that's just me that's why it came forward yeah. is that people say you know for the past three and a half years have been so that's why I brought it to you guys and I knew you did one like early on like yeah. a count and I tried going back uh, since then and I did try to follow a couple of times and pick them when the bus times were, but maybe it's low ridership or what, but yeah. I parked here and the bus came in and turned and went all through the subdivision and then came out the other way. It didn't stop there. So I said, we got to wait until yeah. either I got to verify times or whether it's a different, yeah. how many buses there are, but there was no stops there. And I said, well, I want to make sure it's not, yeah. that's why I didn't want to get it at one specific location. Exactly. Yeah. Is no, that what I, I saw? It. didn't justify yeah. it right now, but I want to keep looking at it yeah. and saying maybe when the ridership is more or it just has started and, I know. and try to see yeah. if everyone's comfort level, either back to school or the comfort level of using the buses yeah. or that sort of, just to make yeah. sure the volume is up there. Yeah, yeah exactly. Thanks, Aaron. Or maybe, maybe just Brian's up there yet. Brian's got his light. Go ahead. Sorry. Sorry, Chair. That I don't want to give the stop sign debate. There, people know my feelings on stop signs, but um, um, like if the issue is the bus stop, then maybe they should move the bus stop if it, if it's a safety issue around the corner, as, as well as an option as opposed to putting in what may be perceived as unwarranted stop signs in there that that we know the research indicates really creates a safety hazard if you put unwarranted stop signs in. And I would like to say I'll, I'll I could reach out. To, uh, no. I didn't want to get into the individual ones, but I'll try and get those contacts. You say those. I know you mentioned the gentleman on the corner, and I can reach out to them and say, yeah. "Tell us what you're seeing. You're there yeah, exactly. all the time, and and we can we're making stops to try and go there when the buses are there, or yeah. you know." But so I'll reach out to the people that are in that location. I agree with you, Brian. Potentially, potentially maybe we could find out where once we know where the buses are stopping. Yeah. You know, exactly. I'm not going to go on the buses, but we had one instance at another school, and I was down there maybe. 10 times and then working with the principal and I only had one incident and unfortunately it was the bus driver that was, you know, but at least it was only one in over the five, six, 10 times I was there at different times and there was only one instance, but there was a few, but we can work with them to say where in that location is the problem and, you know, and I don't know, maybe I know there's one that has an after school program and maybe it's just the evening time that a lot of people are at one location and we can that's mid block or just follow them what Brian said. I already had the discussion. Uh, Bruce and I when we met with um, Greg Goody, and he said it would be helpful for like the school board to tell municipal services too, so that those roads, because there's no sidewalks and there's ditches, those kids are walking to a bus stop. He said it'd be really helpful to know for snow removal which roads are we're pulling everybody into, right? Yeah. So, exactly. yeah. yeah. So. I just found the other, sorry, I didn't have all my stuff here, but I did find those ditches filled. In the one spot we did have where we put one in, and it's not to bore you with data, but we look at the average speed and say, is the measure affecting the average speed in the area? We took some before and after, and we went northbound, southbound, before and after the speeds of it. The average speed changed by a kilometer or two max before and after with the stop sign. The 85th percentile. Stayed the same in one instance, and all of them except one instance went up, and the other instance went down by five kilometers, so it was not a lot. But the excessive speeders, before we had 13, it went to 14. Another we had 38, it went to 37. Another we had two, it went to nine. Another we had 13, it went to 17. So we actually increased. They were stopped or rolled stopped, but then just gunders. So it, but all three residents were happy and thought they fixed the problem, and they were surprised. We, we knew them, so we just said, What do you think? And, and they we shared the data and they went, I wouldn't have believed it. And we said, well, if you get some flight <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But again, it's, uh, the good part was the percentage of those locations were still not a big percentage. It was two, three, four, and five percent of the people that were excessively speeding. Like it wasn't like it was, we had one there with Council Greg mentioned, I think it was up to 16 and 20% in one location. Which we always unfortunately end up with two or three percent 
that are doing, but we're trying to deal with that two or three percent and make the still road decent for the other 95 that are. Sorry, Corey, go ahead. No, it, it's all right. So, on, just on this picture, just as I was looking at it as you guys were talking, at St. Clair and Crozier, is that not a narrowing of it? And don't, didn't we end up putting a three way stop there? Or is yeah, that where we, we put a, when that one there was one long street, we tried putting in and narrowing it in at the streets because we knew we were going to have a long section. The challenge there is the entire subdivision went in with what's called a mountable curb because the driveways, people would buy a lot. I don't want my driveway there, I want it here. Then they got to cut out the six inch curb and they were mad at us for, oh, I just put the new curb, why are you tearing it out? We put it all in mountable so they could have flexibility to have their house, whichever side they want the driveway on. So when we actually choked it in or narrowed it in, it's not a very big obstruction and people don't mind if their cars hit it because they just drive over it. So even though it narrowed it in, it wasn't visible enough that it was going to be a hazard for them to slow down. So we did do it on two or three locations when that went in on a new subdivision to try and eliminate that at the start to say, let's try and choke it in. But unfortunately, it's not a curb that's six inches high. It's only about an inch. They're not worried about hitting their ref and their tires or grades. on transition from the mountable to the... Yeah, the, trou the trouble was I think there's a driveway right directly yeah, opposite yeah. because the driveways are here. So that's why we get into it. Gotcha. We tried looking at it as much as we can, but... And yeah, it wasn't meant for our direction. It was meant for you to say we were trying to have you something back to you to say, here's what we're thinking. Uh, we had budgeted some traffic calming measures to put in. We're looking at trying to buy some, I guess the good these are on the bottom here. I did, there are some of these uh, in the middle of the road in Charlottetown, yeah. this exact ones, but they're using it on a wide street to try and provide a spot for a crossing. They're just using it at a crosswalk to try and narrow up instead of curbing off and making an area. So our proposal is just to say, look, we could use these things in other locations you got a spot, you got a spot. We're trying to have them just in inventory, take them out, put the signs on them. That we could be uh, temporary measures to save. Uh, sorry, Captain Rod. Oh, I was just ready. Your lights on. No, sorry, never yet. I just want to thank you, Aaron. I, th I think, you know, I think it's a start in terms of, uh, like, I think when the, we initially had the discussion around traffic calming, we, we suggested that there were sort of three areas engineering education and enforcement, I think were the three. Um, when you looked at communities who have had some success in slowing people down, those were the three areas. So, you know, I think we've, last year in the budget, we approved an, an extra police officer with primary focus on speeding. And now we're starting to work in some engineering uh, uh, solutions, so I think that's good. I think we still have a piece of work to do on the education side of my understanding at least is that in order to really have success you need to have the three components and I think this is a good step forward on the engineering piece so thank you okay anything else so going forward as it's uh, springs only three weeks out crab dog eh? <laughs> oh, is it still there? <laughs> so is your uh, I guess your request from us with regards to this is just to kind of monitor things as the roads open up and note locations that kind of come up from residents and well I guess we would like to probably bring back one and say I guess our recommendation would be to try one of these with the lower mountable ones perhaps on a mid block whatever a location comes up for okay we got a speed complaint in this area we go out and that we implement something like this to say okay as a trial is this going to lower the speeds and that and do we have to other jurisdictions like I went over to and looked in, online and some of the City of Halifax put out a whole tender on traffic calming. It was through their entire area. There had to be 10 different, they had two different packages that were out doing different treatments throughout different neighborhoods, but it, we're not that extensive. Obviously, we don't have the geographic areas or the, or the budget, but if we're having spots that we want to try different things to say, are they going to work or we want to be able to be prepared to say, not have that discussion when it's a specific year street and year issue, we're going to say, this is what we think we want to do citywide to try something. Let's get that part over with to say this is what we'd like to try to address some ones that come up this year. And then we would buy some of those Jersey barriers or we look at it possibly if we, what the cost is, we can get them actually made just with a forklift prong lift, you know, holder to do it if that's cheaper. And then uh, have those in our, our tool belt to try to address. Uh, there are challenges, as you know, with each method, but. So it's either, are you willing to try something like this as another tool? And if so, that's what we'll proceed to try and price it out further what those costs are and uh, 
once the budget's approved, if there's money in that for, the, for traffic calming, we'll try and implement some of these measures uh, as they come up. Did you mention some of the dollars, the cost? Uh, we, we didn't. We, we were looking at pricing up the individual. We, we will bring that forward to you on, an, on a location because it could be a location where it's a long street like St. Clair. And we're saying, geez, we're going to have to do two or three treatments over that 800 yeah. meters. One's not going to do it or it's just across. Go back, go back to that screen you just had then. I can't Sorry, I might have went too street. fast. No, the one, the, no, the one with the, the trees on the side of the street. Oh, okay. Oh, wait, yeah. there. Would, would the city, I imagine you must have checked this out too, but would we be liable in any way, shape, or form to putting those in the street? Yeah, are there well, any, many, any ac serious accidents we know of? But that's places? the whole point, isn't it? To get uh, people to sleep. We're trying to get this, like, whenever yeah. we went into it, they're actually, as soon as you drove in, it was basically, you're entering uh, traffic, there's traffic trauma methods in here, and then when you got to each individual spot, then they actually highlighted again with signage. I understand yes, that, I'm sure I'm there's liability with everything we do. I, you know? I understand yeah. that, but I'm wondering if they're driving the speed limit. Yeah. And mix yeah. Up in that. Well, yeah. You, you raise a good point. I still think some people that are out walking, if somebody's going by them at 40 kilometers an hour, they think they're excessively speeding. But 40 kilometers an hour is our posted speed limit, and which is common lot. But if you're out walking and someone goes by at 40, it seems like they're flying, you know? But so that's a valid point to think that they're, if people are going 40, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. it is a big difference when they're going by you when you're walking Same or biking. Yeah. <laughs> some people do find it interesting when the dolly is up and the temporary thing that comes up for a complaint and we've heard back from people that complained and it's there and they took the energy then to watch it and they're going they're watching this car and they're going dang they are just going like 40 45 they, they were saying they were flying along and they watched it pop up and the mm -hmm. and the snow removal on the street like that would take uh, two absolutely hours instead of one hour on the permanent one, uh, they did bring them out from the curb and the slate there to allow water and stuff to still drain along the edge. But again, whether this is a snow removal city or, you know. You know <laughs> Aaron, I find it really interesting, the point that you made, and thank you for the presentation. Uh, when you said that, um, you know, you tried some different streets, different areas, and then uh, tested the, the traffic the speeding or, or whatever, and in some cases it was up higher. And then when you had talked to people, asked how they were doing, they thought it was fine. When you pointed that out, were they were they surprised? Were they? They were surprised, but they believed us because it was people that we actually knew that lived in that. We knew happened to know th three different yeah. staff people, new people on the street, and through the course of we just said, you know, so we knew them. We just said, so hey, what do you think of that? And they were like, oh yeah, it's worked. And then we said, well, here it is. And they were like, no way. You know, like, yeah. They were surprised for sure. Yeah. yeah. No, that good, good. But it's not the desired effect. We're trying to target the excessive ones, exactly. and in that instance, we actually kept it the same or increased it. Yeah. We didn't decrease the average speed. We didn't increase the 85th percentile. So. Yeah. No, any that's good. Thanks. Any of those in pedestrian miles? <laughs> sort of thing. Sorry. Any of them what? In pedestrian miles. Pedestrian miles. Any of these these measures? Yeah. Well, that's what when you got the screen there now. Uh. I don't know if there's any issues, but the first, I think the, the issue you're going to have is trying to remove the pedestrians in a high pedestrian area. That's when you start trying to remove them from the equation altogether and, and making a sidewalk in if there's a high volume. Yeah. And you guys currently do that. You try to target your high residential areas, which hopefully would be your higher volumes of pedestrian walkers, and remove them from the equation. And We've got a firefighter with us today, but would that create problems for a fire truck trying to get Absolutely. To and that's one of the, that's one of the uh, cons of putting these things in. They, they recommend, uh, you know, if you're putting in certain things, it will increase. I think we'd have to get them the information, but a couple of seconds to the, each location as far as the uh, response times. And yeah, there's definitely trade-offs to doing, slowing down everyone to try and deal with the 2%. Thank you. Thanks, Neil. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much, Aaron. I guess if there's no other questions with... Uh, Pertaining to that, we can move on to uh, the second and final item on tech services, and I think that is uh, street naming. I think Councillor McFeely had uh, had brought that forward, and I'll just pass it right over to him. I did, and, and really, what brought this forward was I, I, had, I did have a call from an individual that was wondering about it, having a couple of names added to the street naming list, and they're doing the research on them. So. Uh, I said, well, I'll, you know, I'll bring it forward, and I know the mayor had raised uh, 
uh, a couple of names and some concerns there a, a few meetings ago as well. So I thought, well, maybe it's time that we, we took a look at it. Uh, the, the, we had the street naming work group there a couple or three years ago that did a significant piece of work around putting in, in, together a new list of names and quantifying those names. And um, so anyways, I won't we'll tie up much of the meeting other than to say I think there's a need to kind of take a look at it again, maybe add a few more names to the list for valid reasons. Um, the other thing I, I wouldn't mind taking a look at too is, is right now it's, you know, the, the list of names is there as long as a developer draws from that list of names, everything's good. Uh, if they don't draw from that list of names, then it comes, the name has to come to council for approval. Um, you know, a lot of research that goes into the names that are on that list. Uh, I, I don't know if there's some way of sort of being more assertive that developers choose from that list or <laughs> whether, the, whether the city does the naming of the streets as opposed to the developer. I don't know what the answer is. I think it's something worthy of, of uh, review. Um, uh, so I, I guess to put it on the agenda, name really just to suggest that perhaps the, uh, the uh, policy review committee uh, could take a look at it and, and, and bring back a recommendation on street naming and, and whether some additional name should be added to the, to the list. So. Um, yeah. yeah, it's two or three years since we looked at it, so. so. If you're looking for things to do in your committee, I'm trying to find you something. <laughs> so the new streets in the, the subdivisions you had mentioned earlier, Councillor Adams, that's, uh, those names are coming forward, are they? Um, no, those aren't coming forward because they're all on the, na they're all on the approved okay. list. Logie, Ellis, Starlight were all, and Schooner were all on the schooners from Arsenault. Um, they were all on the approved list, so they didn't have to come to council. Okay. So, yeah. Thank you. That's quite straightforward. If there's no questions. Or Thank you, Aaron. Obviously, your staff and yourself did quite a bit of work to gather up that information. Well, probably something for council to consider and think about. So. The floor is still yours, Councillor Duran. You got the end well, Your Worship. I think that's the end of uh, tech services, so I'll close that out and hand it back to you. Motion to adjourn is by Councillor Duran and one by Councillor Snow. Second. All in favor? Thank you.